Okay. Well, so is the presentation working? Because yeah, you just toggle through it. Yes. Just tap through it. Yeah, yeah. I just had to put it on oh. the first slide. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> like, you're on slide five. It doesn't start right. there. <laughs> 28 viewers right now. You're, you're, what? you're live. I'm live. I, I'm, I'm not ready for this. I'm oh, too scared. Good, good what time. do I do now? <laughs> so I also forgot to ask. I doubt you can do it on your computer while we're doing live right now, but if you want to... Put it out to social media. I totally forgot about yeah. all the usual things we do. I don't. What's your? Trying to figure out again. Beats the hell out of me. I don't know my own social media stuff. <laughs> okay. As always, welcome friends, family, relatives, purveyors of great wine, consumers of great wine everywhere. This is a special lecture to my geography of wine class, and anyone else out on planet Earth who's bored out of their mind during the current quarantine. As I always try to do before we get too involved here, could I get at least one or two or three of you to give me a confirmation <laughs> that you can actually hear me, actually see me, and that this is making sense. If you could just type it into whatever chat box, chat room, chat thing that's out there on text. I will take a pause and sip some more sparkling wine while I get that confirmation. Is that you nodding? We got a couple, yes? Yeah, a lot of people say. Do we have more than one person in here that's confirming? Yes. <laughs> this is a entirely ad hoc lecture that I have thrown together for the uh, ever awesome Geography of Wine class. Hopefully it's not too echoey in here. If I could get someone also to give us a little sound test to see what you feel like it sounds like. Is it all right? Am I legible? Because for those of you that know me, I'm speaking very calmly right now. I'm speaking downright quiet for me. And I haven't even got my blood pressure up starting to do this lecture. So things will get louder and more out of hand and more crazy. So as long as you can hear me now and seem, things seem to be working, I'll go ahead and get going. Okay, all right, good. Once again, for those just tuning in, thank you all for joining us for a live from Blacksburg Wine Lab podcast where I allowed the students of the Geography of Wine class uh, this semester here in the strangest of spring semesters 2020, the quarantine semester, to uh, pick a lecture that they would most like me to talk about online while they're all hanging out at home, hopefully with their families. I hope they invited their parents and siblings along to watch this. And uh, what they chose, and by they, I mean all six people who responded to my email out of 1,423 people in the class, six people responded, and bizarrely, three of you asked to hear about champagne and or sparkling wines in general. This is not a topic that I did in any great detail for the lecture series itself for class. There's just so much to talk about when the, in the world of wine, you just can't do it all in a single semester. Hell, I used to teach about history of wine, I used to teach about different wine regions, I used to teach a whole bunch of stuff, but I always ended up running out of time every semester anyway, so that's why I started to record at least the essentials for you to understand wine. Once it's recorded, then I can't run out of time, it's already there, it's already logged in. So I'm going to, for the foreseeable future, lecture about any particular topic that you all, the uh, fans of wine, the fans of Bacchus, want to hear about that I didn't talk about in class. Already, of, of the three of you, that, three of the six who said they wanted to hear about uh, sparkling wines, two other people of that six said they wanted to hear about port and sherry. So I'm like, okay, you're right. I never talked about those things. But anyway, let's get to the lecture. And if you like this at all, if you learn anything at all, and you'd like to see more of this, just let me know. What the hell else do we got to do during these bizarre times? So I'm starting off this uh, lecture saying bubbles, bubbles everywhere. 
but not a drop to drink yet. That is a quote from a famous movie that I dare say 75% of the listening audience, no matter what your age, has seen. The first person that can tell me what that quote is before the end of this lecture wins a bottle of sparkling wine. I know it's probably illegal, but I don't care. Let me repeat the quote. Bubbles, bubbles everywhere, but not a drop to drink yet. Now let's get to the lecture itself. What is it about wine, sparkling wines, bubbly wine, fizzy wine that's so fun and special and everything else? Well, for those of you that are in the class, is everything okay? Yeah, I don't care. For those of you that are in my wine class, you might remember some of these slides from, I believe, lecture one. And what I want to start with is to talk about how sparkling wine is actually one of the main categories of wine. There's only really three main categories or styles of wine, broad styles of wine. Sparkling wine is one of the three. And I started out the lecture series uh, for the class saying there's actually three sets of three that you need to know about to understand wine. If you learn nothing else, I hope you learn these three sets of three. And one of the three was how do you make wine? There are three processes for wine creation. There is viticulture, and that is the growing of the grapes. There is a viniculture, that is the making of the wine from the grapes, that is the grape juice that you make into wine, that's vinification. And then there's a maturation, whether you put the wine straight into a bottle or age it in barrels before you put it in the bottle. All this is a maturation process. And that's the three main processes of making wine, of any wine. But then I gave you a couple of other sets of three to know about wine. And I'm going to take them out of order here on this slide. The second three was general terms to know about wine is blended wine versus varietal wine versus this term called vintage. Varietal wine, I'll start with first, it's the easiest. Varietal wine is any wine, any wine of any style, that is made predominantly with one single type of grape. And there are thousands of grapes out there. Some of the ones you're familiar with, Chardonnay, Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir, Merlot, Malbec. That's a grape. And if you make a wine, you, wine is like anything else. You can make it a wine out of just one grape, or you can make it out of 20 grapes. You can make a soup out of, wine, of different grape varieties and turn it into wine. Bordeaux, a very famous wine, is actually not one single type of grape. It's lots of different grapes. It's actually five different grapes. Anyway, varietal wine is any wine that is, the vast majority is made from one grape. Usually it's 100%. So if you have a Malbec wine, it's 95 to 100% Malbec grapes. You have a Chardonnay, and it's called Chardonnay, and it's a varietal wine, it's 90 to 100% Chardonnay. That is the uh, uh, a kind of opposite of what's a blended wine. A blended wine is more than one grape, and the example I already gave you is Bordeaux. Bordeaux is actually several different grapes at the very minimum, and up to five different grapes uh, on average. Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot are typically the predominant grapes in a Bordeaux, but it can have some other things in there too. So that's a blended wine where a winemaker takes lots of different grapes and makes a wine they feel is really, really good. Okay? And then vintage just refers to the year that the grapes were actually harvested. So when you see a year on a label of wine, no matter what the wine is, that's the year the grapes were picked. It is not the year the wine was made. It's not the year it was put in a bottle. It's not the year it was put on the grocery store shelf. It is the year the grapes were physically pulled off the wine. That's the vintage year. So those other three terms to know to understand wine. Uh, is it a varietal wine? Is it a blended wine? And what's the vintage? Now let's get to the third set of three, which is the primary one to launch this lecture, which is there are three main types of wine. Table wine, a.k.a. still wine, and I'll say why we use the word still wine in a second. And uh, table wine or still wine is, I don't know, 90% of the world's wine, maybe more. Virtually every bottle of wine you've ever had is a still wine. What's the difference between that and other types of wine? Well, the 
second type of wine is sparkling wine, the feature topic for tonight's lecture. And sparkling wine is different from table wine because it has bubbles in it. It has CO2 built into the liquid, into the beverage. It's fizzy. It has bubbles. It's vibrant and alive. And now perhaps it makes more sense why we call table wine still wine. S-T-I-L-L. -L. It's still. It's just sitting there. The liquid doesn't do anything special. I mean, wine is delicious and awesome, but it's, there's no movement. So still wine or table wine versus sparkling wine that has CO2 in, it, in solution, charged up, ready to go. The other type of wine, the other third major category of wine, and there's only these three, is fortified wines. And fortified wines are a table wine that has had straight liquor poured into it. And not really so much straight liquor, but things like ports and sherries, Madeiras, these are wines that have been fortified with alcohol. And usually it's brandy. So you take a distilled uh, a product, a liquor, uh, like brandy, and you pour it into your table wine to increase the alcohol level of that table wine. That makes sense? So three main types of wine, table, fortified, and for the rest of this lecture, sparkling wine. Okay, what's so special about sparkles? And I would like this to be a semi-interactive lecture. I'll be doing most of the talking here, by the way, but I'd like to hear from you also. I should have mentioned this at the onset. This is a Q&A. Uh, you do type in your questions. Katie's here, as always. Uh, my trusted partner, assistant, cohort at all levels of life to translate messages to me. So if at any given second you have a question, type it up and Katie will translate that to me or transfer that to me. I don't think she needs to translate anything unless you're speaking another language. And, and so I'm prepping you on that because I do want some feedback here. I'm not one of those people that begs for feedback. Let's all hold hands. Let's all introduce each other. No, I hate that crap. But I do like to test uh, people's perceptions about things when I'm talking about wine. I like to test people's perceptions about lots of things. Here's the question to all of you, uh, and I'd like at least a couple of you to give me a shout out. Who drinks sparkling wine? Who drinks it? What types of people get up in the morning and have a sparkling wine with their uh, breakfast, with their, uh, 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 what's my favorite, uh, eggs? eggs benedict, or a nice shrimp cocktail at 10 a.m., my usual waking time. What types of people drink sparkling wine? People celebrating. People celebrating. Andrew Major says he drinks it. Andrew Major, oh my God. That is a welcome blast from the past, hearing Andrew Major's name spoken out loud. Thank you so much for tuning in to this debacle, <laughs> my good friend, Mr. Major. Some people said brunch crew. Brunchy people drink sparkling wine? And one might then beg the question, because I'm, I'm always searching for a certain answer. What types of people do brunch? Who does brunch? What, any other answers? Maybe I should uh, uh, more frame the question in terms of who drinks champagne? <laughs> who drinks champagne? Is it for weddings? And then when they think about online graduation, they think of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> weddings and online graduations. OK, all right. Rich people? Rare, you, that's the answer I was looking for. Why can't you people give me the answer I'm baiting you for? Uh, what types of people drink sparkling or champagne? I always think of Thurston Howell the third. Fancy people. Fancy people. Rich people. Okay, and now that begs the second question, which most of you have already started to answer. When do we drink sparkling wine? Do you drink sparkling wine every day? Because I do. When is it you actually drink sparkling wine? Some answers I've already heard. Celebrations, weddings, graduations, be them live or online. Any other times we drink champagne? Special occasion, New Year's. Special occasion, New Year's, a holiday, a party, a celebration. 
And then that begs the third question, why? Why do we drink sparkling? Now we know who does it. The answer for who obviously is, well, everybody drinks sparkling wine, but you don't do it all the time. Okay, when do you drink sparkling wine? Oh, special occasions. So why is it that we reserve special occasions for sparkling wine? Sparkling wine is just wine. So 90% of the market is still wine. You might drink your Cabernet Sauvignon or your Merlot or your Chardonnay every day. But suddenly if we put bubbles into that Chardonnay, holy shit snacks, this is a party. This is a celebration. Something is different about sparkling wine. When it gets rolled out, everybody starts looking around saying, wow, is, there a, is Thurston Howell III in the room? Uh, or is somebody celebrating a birthday, a wedding, a divorce? Uh, <laughs> I'm joking about the divorce. Yes. Uh, but it does seem to be a beverage that commands a presence in and of itself that has been for as long as I can remember something special. And quite frankly, it's not from a production standpoint. It can be a little bit fancy in production. We're going to get to that. But it's, it's a wine like any other wine. But we have a mental perception about sparkling wine that we actually just don't for any other wine. Or we really don't for any other beverage. Can you, it, uh, uh, this question just occurred to me, but is there some other beverage or even a meal that you only do during special certain occasions because it's so rare, it's so unique, it speaks to something special is happening? I don't know, birthday cake? I mean, I really can't think of anything else that has the sort of resonance, that has the sort of level of societal understanding that this is something really, really special like sparkling wine does. The other reasons that sparkling wine, I think, is um, really cool and really awesome is that sparkling wine has this kind of unique attribute that not only do we do it when we're feeling elevated and celebrating and things of that nature, but because of the carbonation, which is in sparkling wine, it actually transfers alcohol quicker into the bloodstream. You think I'm making this up because I'm a goofball, but I'm not. So you actually get a little tipsy off of drinking sparkling wine more so than other wines, a, a quicker tipsy. And so there's a couple different ways you can, uh, several different ways you can get blood, uh, get alcohol into the bloodstream quicker, okay? This is not a, a, a fraternity prank, by the way. So the ways that alcohol is absorbed quicker into the bloodstream is that you can chill a wine. Any chilled wine opens up the capillaries from your mouth down your esophagus all the way into the stomach. And so if it's chilled, the alcohol in that beverage will, is more readily absorbed. Uh, the second way you can get more alcohol in the bloodstream is drink straight, big ass, high proof liquor. So the more liquor that's in the beverage, the faster it will go to the bloodstream. No surprise there. But the third way is often overlooked, and that is that CO2 acts as a conveyor belt into the bloodstream. So when you have a sparkling wine and you chug a glass real quick, it can be even lower alcoholic proof, but it will immediately go into the bloodstream and you just kind of feel fun and a little giddy and it's kind of great, right? And that's why we use it as a celebratory thing because we all clink clink the glasses and all of a sudden we're like, I feel, I feel really good. Especially when you get the champagne cold or sparkling wine cold, which we typically do. So sparkling, cold sparkling wine has two out of the three ways to get a quick tipsy effect. Now, the only real thing that's special about sparkling wine as a major category of wine in general is, of course, I actually went and got ahead of myself, but I'll do it again. Boom, boom, boom. And the only real difference between sparkling wine and regular wine is it's got gas. See, that was supposed to be a punchline. It's got gas. And the gas that it has is carbon dioxide, to be precise. CO2. Not one, CO2. Uh, the same stuff that we're expectorating, exhaling, it's all over the place. When we, 
We breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2, and CO2 is coming out of our car, it's causing global warming, but we love CO2 when it's in a wine uh, because of all these features which we have talked about. Now to keep that, oh by the way, there's CO2 in your soda pop. Anything, any beverage, it's CO2 in your beer. Any beverage that has a fizz, be it Dom Perignon or Bud Light, that's CO2, or Coca-Cola, that's CO2. Push into solution that as it's poured, it starts to, I don't know, I'm not a scientist, coagulate into its CO2 collects into this, into it, back into its gaseous form as bubbles and bubbles up and then, poo, pops out the top of be it Coke, Bud Light, or Champagne. Question from the audience. Question from a, the audience. They make a nitro coffee with this bubbly with nitrogen. Can you make a sparkling wine with nitrogen? Wow, man, right out of the gate, someone asked me some bizarre ass <laughs> question I cannot answer, which is my favorite, so let me make up an answer. Well, I should have had my pipe. I know. It's, it's, uh, when I have a pipe, anybody who's wearing a pipe, anybody that's smoking a pipe, you have the right answer. Obviously, you have the right, whatever you make up, it's the right answer. Pretty sure that's how the world got colonized. The British just walked around with pipes going, well, I think this is mine. <laughs> yes, and everybody's like, wow, he's got a pipe. I guess India belongs to the UK. So the question, sorry, yeah. tap onto this. Andrew Major said there's a company that makes a nitro rosé in a can. So there you go. So thank God Andrew Major's in the house to go ahead and answer the question for me because I did not have an answer that there already is a company that is uh, pushing nitrogen gas into a rosé and putting it into a can. Um, the I don't know much and obviously I know nothing on this particular topic, but I do have a half a century of drinking experience. And I can tell you from drinking experience that nitrogen, uh, 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 nitrous, nitrous oxide, nitrous dioxide? I don't even know, is it nitrous oxide? Or nitrous dioxide that would be in Guinness. All I can tell you about nitrogen when it's in a gaseous form is that we push that into certain beers and not, not a whole lot else. So any of your big stouts that are on tap, like Guinness, those are nitrogen and it, Nitrogen, I believe, and again, this is I'm hypothesizing on the spot, forms much smaller bubbles. I mean, almost minuscule bubbles, because when you get a Guinness on tap push with nitrous, it is not bubbling like soda pop, and it's not bubbling like champagne. It's it's a, almost a froth. It's it's a slow, minuscule, small bubbles froth that just builds up on the head of those particular beers. They bring, the bubbles are so small, they bring a creaminess of, a, of texture. They don't taste like anything, but it's, you're basically slamming so much gas in in such small bubbles that it's, you're basically baking it into a cake, a liquid cake of sorts. Think about how sourdough bread has bubbles and holes in it, or I guess all bread does. But with, when it comes to a dark beer that you're jamming full of nitrous, I, again, I'm guessing here, the bubbles are so small, they fall out of solution very slowly. They don't bubble up, they just cream it up. They make it actually a little more viscous. So if you've had nitrous coffee, someone mentioned, or any sort of Guinness or Beamish or anything like that on tap that pushes through nitrous, an entirely different affair. I have not had any wine like that, but I'll bet my bottom dollar it's coming. And, and as Andrew Major, pointed out he's already seen one in a can. I don't know what it would do to a, I don't know what nitrous would do to any wine because I haven't had it, but I'm more curious to try a nitrous push red wine than a white one for the same reasons that you only use nitrous in dark beers and not light ones. I've never seen a, a lager or a pilsner push with nitrous. By the way, I just realized we are never getting through this lecture. This is like slide two of 500, and we already have a, such a great discussion going on that I'm not sure where to go from here. But I'll pull it back now to get to at least slide four. So CO2 is in solution in uh, uh, Guinness, uh, in your Coca-Cola, and in sparkling wine. And to keep it in there, because it nat all gases naturally want to get out of these liquids and go their own way. Turn back into gases and go their own way. So how do you hold the gas in a liquid? And the answer is pressure. 
All sparkling wines are under pressure. Din, 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 under pressure. And not all sparkling wines or beers are under the same sorts of pressure. Coca-Cola, I don't know what the PSI on these things are, but roughly I would say that soda pop and beer roughly have a baseline of pressure that is pressure to keep them into place so that the bubbles don't blow up or blow up the bottle. And sparkling wines, frizzante or semi-sparkling wines are a step above that for pressure and true sparkling wines are a step above that for pressure to hold that gas into place while not simultaneously bursting the container that's holding them. So sparkling wines are different pressure levels and it does affect the perception of their taste, which is why I'm so glad we had a diversion to go over into nitrous oxide or dioxide in beer uh, and soda pop because it does affect how the flavors are on your tongue. If you've ever had a flat Guinness or a flat Coca-Cola versus a charged one, they do taste different. And that sounds weird, but think about it. It's the exact same crap in the glass. Bud Light sparkling or Bud Light flat, chemically, it's the exact same thing. It's the same formula. But without the bubbles, things don't taste the same. They're not as vibrant. The palate does not pick up on certain flavors the same way as they do when it's a still wine or a flat beer or a flat soda. So keeping that pressure on, the higher the pressure, the more fine the bubbles are inside the liquid. And just so you know that there are many types of, you can go either way, it's fine. You can walk in front of the, what are we here? We're trying to win an Academy Award with this? Would you relax? Uh, there are several levels. I've now mentioned that, I've referenced it already. But now I'm going to start just talking about just about wine until somebody hopefully distracts me wildly. So when we're talking about wines, you will often get a wine, even a still wine, that when you pull the cork or crack the screw cap, that you see a little bit of bubble formation. Just a little, just a little. We call that kind of beady. It's kind of, I won't even say average, but it happens. This is a, a liquid. There are gases that get trapped during uh, production, even unintentionally. There can be yeast that are still working within the bottle or the beverage or the tank that the brewer, the I'm sorry, the winemaker and or brewer thought that the batch was done, but actually there was a little activity still happening. And so when you put it into a bottle, there's a, just a little, just a kick of the yeast or make it a little bit more uh, uh, alcohol and a pushing off a little bit more CO2. So there can be a little bit of something going on in there. When you get an average bottle of wine, a table wine, and you see a little bit of something happen, we just call that beady. Yeah, there's something happening there. It's no big deal. Having said that, um, if you get a table wine or a still wine, a Shiraz or a Chardonnay, and it's fizzy, that's a flaw. That means that the winemaker has actually screwed up and the fermentation was still active accidentally when they put it in the bottle. So when you get something that you're not expecting to be fizzy, and it is, you send that on back. That's not appropriate. Having said that, there's all kinds of crazy wines that are coming out there, uh, pet nat wines and these other natural wines that they're intentionally still fermenting. We'll get to that in about three hours from now if this lecture is still happening. The next level of sparkling, the next level of pressure, and by the way, that's BD can happen with zero pressure. Uh, or if you just have a really good cork slash screw cap situation, it's accidentally trapping something it shouldn't. That's when BD can happen. Semi-sparkling is intentional. Now we're making wine that we want to be holding CO2 and want to have bubbles when you pull the, pull the cork or screw off the cap. Semi-sparkling wines, and you see the technical thing here, one to 2.5 atmospheres. I'm not smart enough to even know what the hell that means. 14.7 to 37 PSI, pounds per square inch on the bottle. You don't even need a special bottle to hold that. Most of your uh, 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 frizzantes, moscatos, moscato de ostis, terms you probably, uh, the wine you probably had, things that are fizzy, that are semi-sparkling, that have a little bit of gusto. These will never 
blow the cap out. They'll never, they should never blow up when you open them up because they only have a certain amount of gas in them. They're only under so much pressure, which isn't a whole lot. So slightly sparkling, semi-sparkling, fizzy even is the easiest way to describe these wines. And there's a lot of good ones. If you've ever been to Italy ever, if you sit down at a table at any decent restaurant, they'll pour you a frizzante wine just for fun. You don't even have to order it. They're like, oh, mamma mia, we have a customer here. Have some frizzante wine. Uh, and now we go to the top tier of gas trap in a liquid, and that is full on sparkling. Uh, and these are ones you've heard of like champagne, true sparkling wine, method champenois, cremant, uh, es Pumuso, uh, Cava, Spumante, Sect even. These are fully on three atmospheres or more. I don't even know, probably 100 PSI or higher wines trapped inside of a bottle. Those are true sparkling. Those can blow up if they're not produced right or, or bottled right, or if you shake them up, uh, or if you pull a cork off too much. Uh, and by the way, let me give you a quick tip too. You always chill sparkling wine. I mean, you always, mostly you chill every single semi-sparkling, sparkling wine, but you never really want to open a sparkling wine that's been obviously shaken, moved around a lot, uh, or that's warm. To reduce the level of blow up ability, you chill the wine down as much as you can. Well, as much as you can. To cellar temperature or refrigerator temperature for one to two hours. One to two hours gets a bottle about as good as it's going to get in a the refrigerator. Yes? They're asking about, um, would Lambrusco be considered semi-sparkling and about, is that way the cork is safe that way that it can't go back in because it's keeping Lambrusco it? is 100% semi-sparkling. Absolutely. And it's semi-sparkling based on its production, which is the Charmat or tank method, which we will get to in hour six. Now. How do we? <laughs> yeah. the cork, why the cork is shaped that way? Is that uh, just well, the, pressure the shape of corks is a la is a convention, just like labeling is a convention, and based on uh, countries, individual subregions of winemaking and the winemaker themselves. So Lambrusco wines do have this flared cork. Well, they're saying all champagnes, but they don't go back in the bottle. Correct. All champagne corks. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's well, there you go. I thought you were talking about Lambrusco. No, no, they're talking about any champagne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, almost every single true champagne, uh, not true champagne, I'm sorry. Let's get the terminology right before we even go forward. True sparkling, full-on sparkling wine. Champagne is just one category of sparkling wine. So the rest of this lecture, I'm talking about sparkling wine. The whole world of sparkling wine is this. Champagne is just this much of that. Okay, so champagne is a subset of all sparkling wine. When it comes to true sparkling wine, like I said, whatever the number, 100 PSI or higher, and three atmospheres, you do need a certain type of cork that won't blow out under that pressure. I didn't even think, I didn't even have this in the lecture, and here we are doing it. So let me, there, there are certain ways to help keep that high pressured liquid in the bottle without bursting the bottle from blowing off the top. The shape of the cork is one way. So they're intentionally flare, and the corks themselves are put under pressure when they're slammed into the bottle. So it's naturally flared out like this, and the corking device smashes it together, and then you jam it into the bottle so that under pressure, it's naturally expanding within the bottle and it does not want to come back out. That's why champagne corks, I'm sorry, sparkling wine corks are naturally flared like that. It, it can hold more pressure based on its design. There are other ways that sparkling wine producers make sure bottles don't blow up. Also involved in design this time with bottles. You find them better. Oh, what about this bottle? <laughs> Look at this sucker. This is hilarious from Beef Clicquot. Comes with its own, I don't even call this a koozie. It's its, its own jacket. And it's a thermal jacket that supposedly holds the Vive Clicquot for, I don't know, what it's like six hours. It'll hold it at cold temperature. Look at that sucker. And you can reuse the koozie. It's adorable. I couldn't help but buy a case of it. We didn't even need it at all. So this is Vive Clicquot, and the reason I wanted to pull this out, a sparkling wine, three atmospheres or more, 
So it has that flared cork in it to help hold in that pressure. For those of you that have ever opened up a sparkling wine, you also know it has a cage. It's got a cage across the top and the cage is holding onto that cork and secured to the lip of the bottle itself. That's your second way that it's holding in that pressure as best it could. And then the third design element is something called the punt. And the punt is the bottom of the bottle. Have you ever picked up a bottle and you're like, why is this big ass hole in the bottom, bottom of this bottle? Are they just trying to rip me off? Why would they make the bottle flat so I could fit more wine into the bottle? Uh, for all, just so you know, side note, it still has 750 milliliters of wine in it. This thing is called the punt. The bottom, the recessed bottom of a bottle and they can be really uh, uh, recessed for certain types of sparkling wine. It's for a certain design element that helps hold pressure, which is if you have the same amount of glass, right, and you had a flat bottom, then there's, this is under say three atmospheres. The pressure within this is pushing out against all surfaces of this glass simultaneously. Certainly, if I start to shake it up, it's, the pressure is going to increase. To try to get the liquid is trying to get out of this bottle. So, what the punt is for is actually to increase the surface area. I know this is kind of hard to explain because I ain't that smart. But if you had a bottle half this size, or I didn't say half the size, but if you had a square bottle, right, you could calculate the exact surface area, and you filled it full of a wine under pressure then you could calculate exactly how much pressure per square inch is being applied to that glass, okay? And that number would be, let's say, I don't know, 1,000. I don't even know what this means. Let's say it's 1,000 is the pressure. If you increase the glass surface, if you make more surface, if you put an indentation in that glass cube, you've actually increased the amount of glass. Therefore, you have decreased the pressure on the glass. If you have the same volume of liquid pushing against more glass, then the pounds per square inch are actually less. That's why we have a punt. It's increasing glass surface. It's increasing contact between the pressurized liquid and the glass, thereby lowering the pounds per square inch being pushed at any given section of this glass. That makes sense? Yes? Can I get a shout out from anybody in the chat room that that actually made sense? Because I'm about three bottles of Clicquot deep right now. I don't know if any of this makes any sense. What's that? More wine. Oh, that's right. The Petulant Natural, which we'll get to in hour five. Okay, did I answer, did I answer that question succinctly? It wasn't succinctly, but sufficiently, I should say. Sufficiently means good enough. Succinctly means quickly. I never do anything succinctly. Well, there are a few things I do succinctly, but we're not going on in on that on camera. So now let's get to slide five. How do we get this gas into this wine? There are actually five ways. I'll try to start making up some time on slides now. Uh, the traditional method, a.k.a. method traditionale, a.k.a. method champagnois. I love attempting to pronounce method champagnois. The real way to do it. No, um, there's no real way to do it. It's the highest tier way to do it. It's the most labor intensive way to do it. It is the highest bar for making sparkling wine. Okay? Traditional, aka method traditional, aka method champagnois. The second way you can uh, put bubbles or get bubbles into wine is the Charmat method, Charmat, or the Italian method, or the Italian Charmat method, or the tank method, or the Italian tank method. I wonder where it was invented. I don't know. Speak amongst yourselves. See if you can figure out. The third way is the transfer method, a situation that's not worthy of another moment of my time. And the fourth method is the ancestral method, AKA what I call the all natural way to get sparkles into wine. The all natural way 
to get CO2 into any beverage. And for you brewers out there, you probably know what I'm talking about already because you call it bottle condition, but we'll get back to that in a minute. And then the fifth way, the lowest tier, uh, I, and these really aren't ranked in terms of quality. Method Trampin' Law is definitely the top. The other ones are just different ways to get bubbles into liquid. This one is definitely the low, this is the low hanging fruit. This is the bottom of the barrel, and that's forced carbonation, AKA the shitty cheap way to get bubbles into any beverage. And I bet some of you kind of know how to do that already too. Let's take it from the top, and the top of course is that method traditionale, AKA method champenois. And I will go ahead now and say, for the record, I've already pointed this out once, I'm gonna point it out now for twice, I'll probably point it out three times before this is over, all champagne subset is sparkling wine. Not all sparkling wine is champagne. You can only make champagne in the Champagne District of France using method champenois. <laughs> That's why it gets confusing because only true champagne uses this method and is from this region of France that uses this method. However, you can use the method any damn place on planet Earth you want. So people make method champenois, sparkling wines in California, uh, in South Africa, in Austria, in Timbuktu, in Brazil. You can do it anywhere you want, but you can't call it champagne. Even if you use the method, you can't call it champagne unless you're from this actual place called champagne. Now, because there's so much to talk about wine, I never get to anything in class anymore. I used to do a whole month of lectures just on France. But over the years, more and more students said, well, I want to know how to drink, and I want to know what to do, and I want food and wine pairing uh, lectures, and I want this, and I want to know how it's made. So I, over the years, pushed out talking about individualized regions. France has always been, uh, not always, France is kind of the wine country on planet Earth. We just preeminently think of all things wine or French. The French didn't invent wine, the French didn't invent wine grapes, the French didn't invent any of these styles, but they paid the most attention to them over the last, I don't know, 500 years, and they've developed whole systems of naming wine and naming regions and uh, building guidelines of how you produce wines in different regions under legal code. So that's why when we think of wine, we're like, oh, well, the French know everything about wine. Eh. They've regulated the most. They've paid the most attention for the longest period of time. I only bring that up because if you would like more lectures like this about certain wine regions and certain wine regions just of France, hit, hit a player up. I'm here for you during wine quarantine. I'm just gonna start calling it wine quarantine because why are we calling it quarantine? That takes, that's letting the virus control the narrative. I'm not letting the virus control the narrative. It's just wine quarantine. We are choosing to stay at home with loved ones and drink wine. Yes. I'll say, plus you're teaching at summer session one, so we could just roll. And I'm going to teach this course in summer session. No, I think summer session two, oh, actually. Okay. And I, I'm thinking about revamping the whole course for summer session two. Cool to just do and just do this. Yeah. Just do it all like this. Um, but the question was on those different ways of making a champagne. How do they know? I'm sure you might get to that later. Though. How do they know what? Which one is done to the wine. How do they know which, how the wine was made? If it's not champagne, how do they Oh, well, yeah, it's not, um, that's not getting ahead because you don't even know what I'm getting ready to say, but um, most countries, and virtually all countries, and I say that out loud, we have standards. We have standards in the world. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. So we have world standards that um, every country kind of agrees to, not on everything, but you can't label your wine as champagne if you're from Austria. You didn't, actually, EU law says you can't do that. It's like a copyright. You can't say that if it's not real. So if you see, you know, a wine from China that says, this is method champenois champagne. No, it isn't. I mean, because one, you're not from champagne. That's a place in France. And two, that makes me question that you actually use the method. But having said that, China, all EU states, the United States, everybody says, wait a minute, if you put it on the bottle that you're saying method champenois, you're, you are saying that you are doing it this way. And if you're not doing it that way and somebody calls you out on it, you can get sued. 
it's truth in advertising, it's truth on the label, just like the food products you eat. So you can't just willy-nilly say, hey, I made this I made this here wine in my backyard. It's milk and champagne wall. Champagne wall boyer. It's like, nah. I can say it, but then somebody can call me out and be like, nope, no it ain't. And the FDA will shut your ass down. In the EU, you'll get sued for using the word champagne. Anyway, I just wanted to pull up the map of France so that you uh, have a rough idea where this fancy ass wine comes from that all of us know by name, even if we don't drink it a lot. Champagne is one of the major big wine regions of France, and here on this map are all the major regions. Everybody in France, every square inch of France produces wine, so there's wine made in all the white areas of this map, but these are the kind of most important, biggest wine producing regions with the, with the most name recognition. And of all of those, Champagne only produces sparkling white wine. I'm oh, sorry, they make some rosés. They don't do any red wine. And one of the reasons why is because Champagne is the furthest north wine region within France. Period. Kind of almost by a long shot. It's pretty far up there. For those of you that have taken my wine class, you know that cooler and cooler climates don't have as much sunshine, don't have as much warmth over the course of the growing year. So you can't produce big, gigantic red wines. And in fact, the further north you go, the harder it is to grow red wines because red grapes require a longer, sometimes hotter, growing season. So you really can't grow a big Cabernet Sauvignon in Alaska. They just don't got the sunlight and don't got the warmth that's needed for that red grape. They might be able to grow white grapes really good. White grapes mature and can be harvested much earlier. They don't require as big a growing season. But now I'm starting to default off into regular lecture stuff, so let's get back to Champagne. Perhaps the most famous of all French wine growing regions that just produces this one thing called Champagne. Synonymous with sparkling wine. Accidentally mistaken for all sparkling wine pretty much all the time. As we've now said, this is a naming convention that is protected by law in France and protected by law in the EU in general. You can't make a sparkling wine anywhere in Europe and put the word champagne on it. That's illegal. It's basically like a copyright infringement. You're saying, I wrote that book called War and Peace. I put my name on it. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You're not that dude. You didn't write that book. That's not your product. You're not from this region. Champagne is a small region, by the way, and it's not even connected. It's like little sections, as you can see on the map there, of vineyards that has this also this huge underground caverns around Reims where a lot of this stuff is produced above ground but then is stored underground. If you ever get to the Champagne region, you don't go visit the vineyards because who gives a shit? It's grapes. You go toward the caverns underneath where they're storing them for riddling, which I'll get to in a minute, and aging purposes. So I'm going to now, this lecture is about sparkling wine, but I want to go ahead and overwhelm you with champagne information so that I can walk away from it and we can talk about other stuff. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Here we go. Champagne, famous region of France, 44,000 acres, over 20,000 growers. There aren't like, there's no like Gallo uh, in Napa Valley that owns one third of, Virginia, of the California wine grapes. These are all small growers that grow their crops and then usually sell the grapes to a couple or a few or I don't know, a hundred different houses that then produce the wine itself. Three, actually my slide says right here, 300 producers of wine who buy their grapes from those 20,000 growers, usually small plots. It is a cooler northerly location, which means that it doesn't get full ripeness, meaning the sugar levels of the grapes don't get super high and there's lots of acid. So when we think of cool, crisp, acidic, tart, awesome wines, usually cooler climate, and Champagne's way up north up there. It is one of the most versatile wines for food pairing, which I should have said in the intro slide when we were talking about why sparkling wines are so great. Sparkling wines, not just Champagne, man, they go with everything. They kind of go with everything. Uh, what do we talk about all the time, Katie? What's the best pairing for Champagne? Fried chicken. Fried chicken. Fried chicken, fried chicken and champagne. It's one of the, it, to me, it could be the apex of our species. 
endeavors. It could be as good as we ever get. I could be looking at a Van Gogh painting, listening to Beethoven, and eating champagne fried chicken. I'm not sure our species is ever going to do any better. I might just have to quit right now. That, <laughs> that, I don't know. That, I, there's nothing else to say. What else can I say? Uh, champagne goes great with uh, sparkling wines in general, with champagne, every single fried food, and a variety of everything else. It just is one of those wines, because it's acidic, because it has certain elements that we'll get to in a minute, it's, ah, here it is, crisp acidity, vibrant body, has yeast, it has fruity flavors like apple, green apple, some hints of citrus, some hints of lemon sometimes, but it also has yeasty, toasty, bready, cheesy characters, or ones that have been aged. So it, it's almost, it's not exactly what I'd call umami, which is now being recognized as a certain, you know, distinct flavor that our tongue can detect. When I grew up, we didn't have umami on how you learn what the tongue can taste. A sweet, salty, bitter, blah, blah, blah. Umami is now one that's widely accepted. I wouldn't call the flavor profile of champagnes as exactly umami, but man, it hits all these check boxes that just make it great. And it's like a full meal in a glass and it pairs magnificently with lots of other things. But now I'm getting just, I'm waxing too poetic and I'll say it now, I think I was gonna say it for the third time. All champagne is not sparkling wine, but all sparkling wine is champagne. So let me get to how this is made. And now I've gotta, hang on, I gotta, I gotta get limbered up. Let me do some stretching. I gotta do some deep knee bend. I'll get some squats. <laughs> One and two will do. It's a question from the audience. It's Good. I need a question before I start this because once I start, all hell's getting ready to break loose on how you make champagne. Go. <laughs> they wonder if you knew what the soil type was in champagne. What makes it special? Uh, I do not know. I, I am 100% positive that champagne growers and enophiles and wine writers all 100% believe that the soil plays a gigantic part in why champagne is special. I don't know what that is. So I can tell you just off the top of my head, it's gotta be limestone based soils. And the only reason I know that is because they have big, huge underground caves and cabins. I think many of those are man-made, but it's gotta be easy to carve out of those places. So I think it's limestone based. Although what that particularly means for the soil profile and what it does to the grapes, I really don't have a clue. I'm a huge fan of terroir, for the record. Huge fan of terroir. Terroir, in my mind, means that every particular plot of land on planet Earth has very distinct, very distinct characteristics. Characteristics of bedrock, characteristics of the soil on top of that bedrock, characteristics of climate, the growing season, the highest temperatures, the lowest temperatures, the humidity, fog, precipitation, snowfall, lowest temperatures, all of that together, how cloudy it is, how you till the soil, what pesticides you use, what herbicides you use, do you do it all natural? What do the humans do to those grapes once they harvest them in Champagne or Rioja or uh, Mendoza? To me, in my brain, all of these things and a million other factors play into what terroir is. What is it that happens in this little plot of land, in this part of the planet, and what the people do to the grapes that grow on that plot that make the wine unique? And I am, I've, I've gone to the mountain, all right? Muhammad was there, I've gone to the mountain, I've seen Jesus, he spoke to me. I am a huge believer in terroir. It's one of the reasons why wine is so fantastically great and fun is because every single wine is different. Every single wine, every wine on planet Earth is different because terroir is different every place on planet Earth. Having said that, I don't know that soil, if the one component of terroir that soil plays an over huge role in the bigger picture of terroir. A lot of uh, uh, people will say that it does. I am not one of those people. I think it's the big picture. I think it's the whole picture. Soil plays a part. Some vineyardist, some uh, sommeliers, some enophiles say, nope, soil's a big thing. We can have that debate, but I'm not going to because they're not here to defend themselves. I win. Um, I don't know what's special about that soil, but I'm positive that it's not just the soil, it's the overall thing. I mean, 
if you think about it, why did they even grow grapes that far north? Why did they pick the certain grape varieties they did to put into the, what, what sh now champagne? How do they till the soil? What decisions were made to make them do this and that and the other? There's a lot going on in why wines taste certain ways in certain regions. Soil isn't the whole picture. It may be important. It may be more important in other places, uh, but I don't know how important it is here. Okay. Yes, another question. Good, because I'm not ready. I'm not ready for describing Method Champenois yet. Well, someone was asking if they bought grapes from Champagne and, or juice and then produced it somewhere else, could it be labeled Champagne or not? No. Nope. Uh, the grapes, uh, French AOC law recognized by EU law, you have the grapes have to be from that place and the wine has to be from that place. And I, that's a really great question, actually. It, it seems like that's an easy one. I'm just brushing off my cuff of like, no, you can't. It, there's actually a philosophical element to this. And it's at the heart of how Europeans see wine different than Americans see wine. Most Americans see wine as this great beverage that we think is delicious and perhaps nutritious and it goes well with food and it gets you drunk. We like it. Europeans more often than not look at wine as an expression of the place that it's from. It's the cuisine of the place that made it. It's quite important that you understand that Chianti is from this place and Chianti was grown in this place and Chianti, the Chianti grapes are expressing the soil of that place and the Chianti growers are growing those grapes to express that place and winemakers in Chianti are making wine to express that place. And consumers can then go buy a bottle of Chianti and know they're drinking that place. Not so much in America. America, we're like, is it good? I'll drink it. I like Cabernet Sauvignon. It's great. Where do you like it from? Oh, hell, I don't know what you got. California makes great Cabernet Sauvignon. So does, Cal uh, so does Oregon. So does Virginia. I mean... We're more focused on the grape and the product, whereas Europeans say, no, it's an expression of this place. And again, it's almost like copyright or trademark law. You can't say that I made, I, John Boyer in Virginia, made a Chianti in my backyard. No, it, you, you didn't use the right grapes. Okay, well, let's pretend like I used the right grapes. I went actually and got the exact same grapes they use in Chianti, and I grew up in my backyard. No. It's not the same terroir. Okay, then I went to Chianti, I bought a bunch of grapes, I came here to my place in Virginia and I made Chianti. No, you're not getting it, Boyer. It's from this place and it's not just about the grapes and it's not just about the juice. It's also about the tradition and the history of the winemaking itself. So it's the whole package. You can't, you can't deconstruct European regional wine. It's the whole package and nothing but the package. So buying a bunch of grapes from Sicily and bringing them to Virginia and saying I'm making Sicilian wine, I mean, when I'm saying that out loud, does that make any sense to you? I made the Sicilian wine in Virginia. How? Because you bought some grapes? So no, the answer to that is a firm no. Uh, and even in America, if you have a wine, if you buy a wine in Virginia and it has the word Virginia wine on it, legally, legally, that means that 80, 85, 75 or 85 percent of the grapes have to be grown in Virginia. But why would you label it otherwise if you didn't make the wine here too? There's nobody pulling in California fruit, which people in Virginia do. You, you can go buy 20 tons of grapes from California. You totally can do that. And you can bring it into Virginia. You totally can do that. Totally legal. But would you put the word California on the label? I'm not even sure it's illegal, but people would find it very bizarre. And people would say, why did you put that on there? That doesn't make any sense. Because if you're going to have a label a wine as California, why the hell wouldn't you go out to California and just make the damn wine? I love being wildly distracted by interesting questions like this. I don't know if that helped at all, but I'm ready. Okay, I did two deep knee bends and I answered two questions. Can I get, 
Can I do it? Are we in hour four of this already? Oh my God. Are we? Somebody call the law. This bar has got to get shut down. All right, I'm ready. Here is the process by which Method Champenois makes true champagne or makes a sparkling wine if you don't happen to be in the place called Champagne. Okay, I got a long list here that includes the whole grape making, uh, whole grape and wine making process. I'll skip to the uh, pertinent parts. You harvest the grape, you grow the grapes, got it. You harvest the grapes, got it. You press the grapes to get the juice out of it, yeah, we got it. Here's where things tend to differ in champagne from other parts of planet Earth. In other parts of planet Earth, you get the juice out of the grapes, you make wine. In Champagne, because of their high profile, because of their status, and again, I'm talking specifically about Champagne now, not all sparkling wine. In Champagne, it, it's just brilliant. I don't know how these people do it. They have people that go around and taste grapes in the vineyard for acidity, sweetness levels, fruit flavors, the whole nine yards. They pick certain vineyards to make certain batches of wine out of. So they'll batch out the wine and make, say, they'll make a big batch of Chardonnay from this vin from Vineyard X. Then they'll make a big batch of Pinot Meunier wine, which is a different type of grape, from uh, a, a Vineyard Y. Uh, and they'll have a Vineyard Z that has some Pinot Noir. Ah, that's a grape you know. And they'll make a batch of wine out of that. And then during the winemaking process, they actually are going around and tasting the different wines that are being produced. These are still wines. These are table wines. They're just making wine at this point. And then, based on how they taste the profile of that vintage, that is the grapes being turned into wine that year, they start doing blendings. So they're like, okay, well, give me 40% of that tank of Chardonnay, 30% of that tank of Pinot Manure, and you know, 40% of that tank of Pinot Noir from these vineyards, and now let's blend that into this tank over here to finish off uh, that fermentation. This can be done over multiple years, by the way, too. So you could have a year-old Chardonnay in a tank that's already fully fermented, and you now blend in some of the current vintage Chardonnay and some current vintage Pinot Noir with a two-year-old Pinot Noir. I'm, I'm making up numbers now. But this can happen across years. And by the way, one of the reasons they blend, this is blended wine. Ah, remember back to an hour ago when I started this lecture, we talked about varietal wine versus blended wine. So when you, make, when you harvest your Chardonnay grapes and make it into Chardonnay wine in one tank, that's a varietal wine. But in Champagne, all Champagne is blended. So they're taking, up to a point, I'll get to this in a minute. So they're taking different, three different grapes and blending them together like a cook in the kitchen to make a really great soup. They're blending them together to get the flavor that they want for that year. And one of the reasons why they blend over vintages, meaning they blend, what year is it right now? 2020. So in 2020, in another six months when they start harvesting grapes, yeah, six months, they will blend in 2020 vintage grapes with 2019 vintage wine and perhaps even 2018 vintage wines, depending on the house. And the reason they're doing this is because if you've ever had champagne, there's consistency. They taste the same year after year. That's why you blend, and that's why you blend across vintages. That feels like a test question. I should have told people they should be making test questions for this. So blending across vintages helps with consistency so every year taste about the same. That's what you want. That's what most commercial products want all the time. Everybody wants, you want consistency in milk. You want it always to taste the same. You want consistency in Coca-Cola. You want it to always taste the same. And wines, most wines, actually embrace the fact that it's different every year. So their wines taste a little bit different every year. But when it comes to things like champagne and Dom Perignon, and you're gonna pay three or $500 a bottle, People want consistency. They want to know that that $500 bottle tastes like what all the wine writers have been writing about for 50 years. So that's why you blend across vintages in true champagnes for consistency of flavor, right? That's just, at this point, we're still just making wine. That's all still just table wine. One last shout out. The people that do this are 
certifiable geniuses. And I've seen this in action. People can act, people do this for a living and they go around and taste 20 different batches of Chardonnay and can detect, not only detect the differences between their batches of table Chardonnay, but in their brain, they know what percentages to blend in with the other grapes, the other varietal wines being made for blending. And they also, in their brain, know what, how this is going to age and what it's going to taste like three to ten years from now. I, I don't think nearly enough has been written about these beyond certifiable geniuses. It boggles my mind. Anyway, those people get paid a hell ton of money because it's a skill set that's almost impossible just to invent on your own. It's just knowing everything about this product and doing it for 20 to 100 years. Anyway, that was another side note. Let's get back to, now we have a table wine. We have a wine made from several different grapes, perhaps over several different vintages, but it's a wine. We're talking about sparkling wine. How do we get the sparkle sparkles? Once you've made the wine to, the, to your taste specifications and aging potential, you're actually going to then add in something called liqueur de tirage. I like to call it dosage. It's a dose. So the dose or the dosage that you're going to put back into this table wine is a combination of perhaps unfermented wine or, or only half fermented wine. So some sort of wine that still has some sugar in it or that and a combination of just straight up grape juice. So you've held some of the grape juice after you've harvested the grapes, pressed the grapes, squeezed out the juice. You can actually just collect that juice and cold store it. So it's not fermenting, it's just, it's grape juice. So you can do a combination of a semi-fermented uh, wine that still has some residual sugar and a grape juice, which still has all of its sugar. And you kind of make a little batch and you put it back into the wine. Now, wait a minute, what's that gonna do? If you put sugar back into this solution, you're providing more food for the yeast. The yeast are the little critters. They're gonna eat the sugar and produce CO2 and alcohol. Why did I say CO2 first? Because it's the CO2 we want here. We're not even that concerned about making more alcohol. So this dosage, this dose that you're gonna put back in, goes in at this point specifically to make bubbles. So here's how we do it. We're going to take all of our table wine that's been blended, whatever, across varieties and vintages, and we're gonna start putting it into the bottles. It's done, it's all, that wine's all fermented, there's no more sugar. It's exactly the way we want it. As we now start putting the wine into bottles, like the bottle that you're gonna buy, this bottle at one point didn't have a label on it, completely blank, it was probably all dirty and filthy, covered in shit, and was on a bottling line in Champagne region of France, going down a bottling line. And it was being filled this much full of the wine, and then it's getting a dose. So this much of it, it's like a splash, it's like a shot. Let's call it shots. The champagne itself does a shot. But it does a shot not of alcohol, it does a shot of sugar, a little sugar shot. So you put that tirage, that liqueur de tirage, that dose into the bottle, and then you put a cap on it. Yep. There's, and by the way, there's active yeast in that little shot of sugar that you put in there too. So when you put that in there and you put a cap on it, now you've got sugar, you've got yeast in solution, and the yeast will eat that sugar, it will produce this much more alcohol, but more importantly, it produces CO2. CO2 that naturally would have escaped during the regular fermentation, during the primary fermentation, as yeast are eating sugar game busters and making alcohol and CO2, you just let that CO2 float off in the la la land, let it go. Otherwise, if you try to trap it all, you blow the hell out of the tank that you're fermenting in. So you let the primary fermentation, all the CO2 goes away, but we're putting a cap onto this bottle. So now it's trapped. 
And as the yeast eat the sugar, it produces alcohol and CO2, the CO2 is forced to stay in solution. Damn. This is a really good lecture. We should have Tom Hanks give this lecture with, like, CGI and shit. <laughs> with a coconut head behind him. <laughs> that, my friends, is how this beverage, this bottle... And this is, it's a non-vintage, but I'm assuming this is probably done four years ago. Three to four years ago. Three years ago, this bottle was blank and had a cap on it. This beautiful bottle now and this beautiful neoprene sleeve three years ago was just a shitty green bottle with a bottle cap on it. And the cap was all important because it's forcing that CO2 to stay in here. However, we still have to get it looking pretty. How do we allow this fermentation to occur in this bottle and get it to this pretty stage several years later? Something called, while the fermentation, the secondary fermentation is happening in the bottle that's providing all that CO2. It's called riddling. And I love riddling because it always reminds me of the Riddler from Batman. Riddling, after they dose these suckers, put this liquor detrage in there, they actually put them in certain racks upside down, okay? And they do it upside down at certain levels. So it starts at this level, and then for the next, I don't know, let's call it a year, they come in every week, two weeks, three weeks, I don't know the details, it doesn't matter, and they have somebody turn it. They turn it a little and angle it a little more. And they turn it a little, and, and two weeks later they turn it and angle it. And then the, two weeks later they turn it and angle it. Two weeks later they turn it and they angle it. Two weeks later they turn it and they angle it. So at the end of whatever the time process is, you have a whole shit ton of Dom Perignon or Vive Clicquot that's all angled up like this. Now why would you do this riddling thing? Riddle me that, riddler. Because what you're doing is you're actively forcing all, not forcing, but allowing all of the yeast, which are procreating, they're eating sugar, they're multiplying, they're having babies, for those technically uninformed. They're multiplying, and they're dying. So as they eat, they go through their life cycle, they eat some sugar, they procreate, uh, they, they uh, kick out some alcohol and CO2, then they die. And as they die, their bodies accumulate up, and that's the only reason you riddle, is because over time you want all of the dead yeast all sitting down in the neck of the bottle stuck there. They're forming basically like a natural cork. And now that I think about it, biology-wise, isn't that how coral reefs are formed? Isn't it all these microorganisms that are eating and living and breathing and then they die and what they pile up and that becomes the reef? I don't know. I'm just making this shit up as I go. Some biologists don't. What are you biologists out there? Check my facts on that. So we've got this bottle and now we've got a little plug literally a plug about where the cork goes into a bottle of wine is a plug of this once active live yeast now all dead bodies that's plugging it up who invented this i don't know but it's brilliant for the next phase so after you've aged it and you've allowed the secondary fermentation this bottle now has co2 trapped in solution it's the fizz and you are going to send it through a machine which flash freezes the top. It actually freezes the top. It's like this now, and it's going through and freezing, 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 freezing each bottle. Then they have people that are on the other end um, doing something called degorgement. So they actually pop off that bottle cap, and it's a bottle cap, not a cork. They pop off the bottle cap, and the pressure that's been built into this bottle during this process will blow the, the plug of shit right out of it. Gone, baby. It's out. And now you've got sparkling wine. In this case, champagne. You can do another little dose back in of some sweet stuff. And I'll wait for, uh, uh, for the next couple slides to get to that. But you can put a little bit more uh, sweet stuff back into it to affect the flavor profile, whether you want it dry or sweet. And then you recork it with those fancy ass corks. You put a big wire cage on it. You clean up the bottle. You put a label on it, and now it's worth $500. Whew. 
Okay. That, my friends, is the method champenois, the traditional method for making high-end sparkling wine. And if you make that high-end sparkling wine in champagne, you can call it champagne. If you make that high-end wine exactly that same way, five miles outside of champagne, you can't call it shit. No, I'm just joking. You can still call it some other things, but you can't call it champagne. Okay, that is method champenois in all of its glory. I was gonna try to get to the next slide before hour four, but I do wanna stop and say, now do you understand, if you, if you know nothing else about sparkling wine, now do you understand why method champenois wines cost more money? They just cost more money. Uh, and you just think about the time involved because this is a multiple year process. Think about the time involved, because they age these things out, by the way, in the cellars during the riddling process. It's usually a year to three years. Think about the skill involved of people blending those wines over vintages. Think about a business that has to hold onto a product for three to five years before they even sell it. This is why these wines, and just the labor, just the labor involved, this is why these wines cost more money. So I think that there are a lot of wildly inflated prices when it comes to champagne. I mean, really? Really? Is Dom Perignon really worth $3,000 vintage from 1990? I don't, I, really? I mean, this guy's right down the road that did the exact same process and their wine's only a hundred bucks. So there is definitely price inflation based on scarcity and brand name. Having said that, this is a labor and time ex expensive product, and that's why they, in general, cost more than sparkling wines. You can go to Kroger and get a $2 sparkling wine. You ain't gonna go to Kroger and get a $2 champagne, and that's why. I hope you don't go to Kroger at all. Why don't you come to Blacksburg Wine Lab, for God's sakes? Help a brother out during quarantine wine time. Okay, to finish off champagne for those that are now fully engaged in this particular product in this particular place. Champagne has a very distinct recipe. The recipe is Chardonnay, a grape you, under, you know and understand, Pinot Noir, a grape you know and recognize, and Pinot Meunier, a grape you've never heard of. Because <laughs> it's used just as a blending agent that brings certain acidity to the beverage that the other ones perhaps not lack, but Pinot Meunier, is like salt and pepper or sage. It's something you spice up your dish with. It's not the main dish. That's why you've never had a varietal wine of 100% Pinot Meunier. You just never had it. And by the way, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it because I like calling it Pinot Manure. Uh, and I'm not sure that Manure or Meunier is proper, but I like saying it that way. There are some other types that I'll touch upon in a second. Uh, there's something called Blanc de Blanc, a Blanc de Noir, and even Rosé. Champagnes. Rosé you get, that's pink. Blanc de Blanc is white, Blanc de Noir is more red, but I'll get to that in just a second. Sweetness levels you also probably get confused about when you're thinking about sparkling wines. And this is another reason why I started with Champagne. Because Champagne is so regulated, has been so regulated for a century, they basically wrote the rule book. So I, I talk about Champagne in all this detail because the rest of the lecture will take me 20 minutes because it's way easier. Champagne is a high bar, and including with levels of sweetness. So they're the ones that said, here's exactly how you label a bottle of champagne for sweetness. If it's brut, the term we're probably most familiar with, you can call it brut if you like, I don't care. It means there's less than 1.5% residual sugar. And that's not that much sugar. It's, it's almost unde completely undetectable sugar to the human palate, at least for most of us. Extra brut, less than 1% residual sugar. Sec, 1.7 to 3% residual. Demi-sec, and, and, and all of these are what most of us would consider dry. Brut, extra dry, and even sec, most of us would say, that seems pretty dry. Then you get to demi-sec, or, or semi-dry. Yeah, that gets, okay, I can detect a little bit of sweetness. And dull, D-O-U-X, Dope. I call it the Homer Simpson pronunciation is dope. That's sweet. And that's more than 5% residual sugar. And any of us would say, oh no, that's sweet. I got that. 
Now that's the reason why I explain this, and it's actually way better in this awesome graphic, which I should have told you from the get-go. If you all want, I'll just post this whole PowerPoint, this whole keynote presentation. You can have it. What the hell is it to me? I made it, but it's yours. And I can put the whole thing online somewhere. Do we have a place, Katie, that we could put up something for download through Blacksburg Wine Lab? Yeah, on the website or I don't know. Or we'll figure out. We'll put it on a website somewhere. You can download the whole thing because graphics like this I really love, and that this graphic is particularly showing that it all it lines them all up from brute not nature or natural, which I've never even heard of. I've never drank a champagne that's brute natural, which is pretty much zero sugar. Uh, from extra brut to brut to extra dry, and this is where it gets confusing with the French. So extra dry is actually sweeter than brute or extra brute. <laughs> so I know, just look at the diagram. The diagram helps a lot. So uh, brute natural and extra brute pretty much have no sugar at all. All the way to dope, which has enough sugar for anybody to detect. Dry is somewhere in the middle, actually. So dry is dry, and then there's extra dry. But it's not as dry as brute. <laughs> I know, it's the French, why ask why? Oh, 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 why you ask me why? I went into that detail because the French system is pretty much the system that everyone else on planet Earth has accepted. So if you know what brut is for champagne, you know what brut means in a bottle of sparkling wine from Argentina. You know what brut means from a bottle of Aust Austrian sect. It means it's dry for all practical purposes. And I throw up this graphic just for those of you that are like, I don't know, what is detectable sugar? Well, um, you've probably had vodka or any real full-on liquor. They ain't got no sugar. <laughs> so vodka is a good one to pick because it has no flavor either. So a vodka soda, soda water, pure soda water, not anything with sugar in it. Um, that's tonic water. Tonic water has sugar, right? Soda water has nothing. So a vodka and, and uh, a soda... This is what people on a diet drink, because, you know, you got to drink even on a diet. As zero sugar. There's nothing in it. Uh, right after that is a Brut Natural Champagne. It's got so little sugar, you might as well drink vodka. Actually, I take it back. Drink the Brut Natural Champagne. 0.5 residual sugar in Brut Natural. One uh, 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 gram residual sugar in Brut. Gin and tonic is 14. You go up to Starbucks latte is 17 grams, then up to a margarita, which has 20 grams, and then a Jack and Coke at 33 grams of residual sugar in the beverage. That, we're all sick with alcohol here. I guess we could have done food, but who the hell eats food? So that gives you a sensibility that even a demi-sec or a semi-dry, detectable sweetness in a champagne and most sparkling wines is... Half of half the sugar of a gin and tonic. So, do you think a gin and tonic is exceptionally sweet? Probably not. Maybe you do, but probably not. That gives you a sense of the scale of the levels of sugar. Even dope, dope champagne probably is at the level of a gin and tonic, if one's counting calories. Now, I had mentioned in a couple slides ago several other terms that there are some variations within champagne that are still true champagne. And that is that you can have something called a Blanc de Blanc. And I'm going to say for the third time in less than two minutes, I'm talking all about champagne now because everyone else adopts these exact same naming conventions everywhere on planet Earth. So a Blanc de Blanc in champagne means it's a champagne made completely of Chardonnay. Hereafter, I've now told you this long story about how they blend between three different grapes and da, 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 it's really hard and they're really experts and they go across minute. Um, if you see the words Blanc de Blanc on a champagne, it's still a champagne because they wrote the laws, all right, for their system. Uh, it just means it's 100% Chardonnay and the sparkling wine. It's from Champagne. A Blanc de Noir is 100% Pinot Noir from Champagne. It will not be red, by the way. So for those of you that have taken my classes, you know that every single wine grape, whether it's a white grape, a green grape, a red grape, a purple grape, or a black grape, if you smash the juice out, all the juice is clear. So either the reddest or the darkest of the blackest of the purplest, blackest grape, the juice is clear. 
So you can make a white wine out of any grape, even red ones. And when it comes to Blanc de Noir, they're not saying that this is a dark champagne. They're saying this is a white of black. So Blanc de Blanc is a white of white, a white wine made from a white grape. Blanc de Noir is a white of black. We're taking a Pinot Noir dark skin grape, squeezing out the juice, getting rid of the skins, allowing no skin contact, no color. And we have a white wine made from a dark grape. A Blanc de Noir. Sounds like a detective genre. If I were to ever write a detective novel, my name would be Blanc de Noir. From the Champagne region, here fighting crime in Southwest Virginia. Who stole the sign off that McDonald's? Blanc de Noir is on the case. <laughs> and the final one, of course, is Rosé. Uh, you can't have Rosé Champagnes. True Champagnes labeled as Rosé that do have a little bit of skin contact, thus allowing a little bit of color, and thus the pink character. There's a couple of other, I'm sorry, yes? Uh, questions. Uh, does the price inflation filter change evenly down the chain of creation. Pretty much like, who makes the most when, with wine? Is it the grower or they're asking who gets the most money? Well, that's a broad question about wine production and who gets profits from it. And if you know anything about how chocolate is made, how coffee is made, how every single agricultural product is made, you already know the answer, so which the is the grower down. gets the least. Yeah. The grower gets the least. Wine is a little bit unique in the agricultural world in that many times, the grape grower and the wine maker are the same person or work for the same company. So as soon as you start processing a raw agricultural commodity like grapes or coffee beans or chocolate beans, when you start processing them into the thing that the consumer actually is going to consume, you're raising the value. So it's a little tricky to say that wine is just like coffee beans and all the farmers are getting screwed because there are a lot of farmers that also make the wine or at least work in conjunction with a winemaker or an estate. So they get a little bit more. If you look at all agricultural products, grape growers probably do the best in terms of getting money from the finished bottle price that consumer pays. Wine would be your best bet for the, most, the, the biggest percentage that would go back to the grower. And again, those numbers would be skewed because the wine, the grape grower and the winemaker are often the same human, or often on the same in the same company, so that that makes it tough to call that one. I thought maybe what you when you were asking me that question, you were asking is, are these sparkling wines really worth five hundred dollars? Ah, oh, hell no! I, I don't think any wine is worth five hundred dollars. I've had five hundred dollar wines and I immensely enjoyed them, but I'm not paying five hundred. At a certain level, and this is true, I guess, with all luxury items. You get to a certain point of price that it's just hype. It's reputation, it's exclusivity above all of it. It's exclusive. This is so pricey, you poor people can't afford it. Which makes rich people want it more, I guess. It's like Lamborghinis. I don't know, could they make more Lamborghinis? Yes, but why would they? They'd go down in value. So you, the market will bear whatever price the super rich are willing to pay. And in that circumstance, the growing house would actually make a lot more money. So I would assume, and now we're in the conjecture world here, but I would assume that most champ true champagne grape growers do pretty damn good. Because if their vineyards were located 50 miles outside of the Champagne district, their vineyards wouldn't be worth shit. So it really is that you're in the right place at the right time. You may be a simple farmer growing grapes, but you're in Champagne. And those grapes are worth more simply because you're in Champagne. And then if you do a good job growing them, they're going to be sought after. So you're going to get a lot more money. The only thing that I can think of that's even remotely close, and it is a distant second, is the current trend towards... Um, exclusive cacao beans and there's certain species of cacao tree if you don't know what cacao is it's, it's this big ass pod looking freaky thing that make that has chocolate beans in it beans in it that make chocolate and so much like wine grapes 
there are many different subspecies of cacao, and so there might be some lost in the Amazon rainforest on the foothills of, you know, Mount Hikamagaro. There's this one grove of cacao trees no one's ever gotten to, and it's a different species, and it's unique. Yeah, that shit is where you're seeing people charging $500 for it. A freaking I, chocolate bar. That's right. I was just looking at chocolate we could buy. Yeah, we were just buying chocolate. Yeah, what was, was like, the most expensive one you saw? Four hundred fifty wholesale for us to buy. Four hundred fifty dollars. Four hundred fifty dollars for a case. That's a wholesale. No, per bar. Per bar. <laughs> yes. Four hundred fifty dollars for a bar and of chocolate. That was wholesale. Chocolate. So that was like Willy Wonka can kiss my ass. Like I would ne never buy four hundred fifty. $4.50 makes me cringe for a bar of chocolate. I'm old. I just go get a whatchamacallit. It probably didn't even have any damn chocolate in it at all. I feel like whatchamacallit might be the answer to a question for the quiz for those in the wine class. <laughs> Do you guys even know what a whatchamacallit is? Do you know what a whatchamacallit? Do they still have whatchamacallits? It's actually a chocolate bar that probably has no chocolate in it. It was like kind of like a Rice Krispie treat that then they made sweeter somehow and then covered in fake chocolate. Oh my God, they were fantastic in the 70s. Fantastic. Thank you for the distraction. Yes, people from, wine growers from famous regions working for famous houses get a lot of money. Winemakers in Southern Italy growing grapes make just as much as itinerant Mexican laborers picking cucumbers in California. It's the way of the world, especially with agriculture. But let me get to slide four of 753. And here's three more terms, one of which I've already covered when it comes to champagne, and that is uh, non-vintage. You will often see NV on a bottle of champagne or any sparkling wine, and that just means non-vintage. And, and you already know what vintage means, which is the next one on this slide here. The vintage is the year the grapes were harvested. If you see a year on any bottle of wine, whether it's regular wine, still wine, table wine, sparkling wine, or even champagne, if you see a year on the bottle, that's telling you the consumer 100% of the wine in this bottle came from this exact harvest. All these grapes were harvested in 1992, and there ain't nothing else going on besides 1992. Having said that, that's vintage. The wild majority of champagne and sparkling wines are non-vintage. NV means, no, 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 it's part of the process. We blend, you know, Dom Perignon, most of it is non-vintage. You can find vintage Dom Perignon, you'll pay a hefty price for it, but most of it is non-vintage because they're trying to make consistency across years, a topic I already talked about. So most sparkling, non-vintage. When True Champagne puts a date on it, they're saying this is the greatest year we've ever had. This is the most magical, freaking awesome fruit, and it is so sent from God special that we're making our sparkling wine from just this year's vintage. It's that awesome. And it doesn't happen very often. It, you are. For obvious reasons, perhaps, God doesn't smile on grapes that often. He's pretty busy trying to cure COVID, I guess. I don't know. And on top of that, it will not, it will have bottle variation. So if you're used to Dom Perignon tasting the same way and you drink it every day for breakfast like I do with my shrimp cocktail, um, and you've had it every day for 20 years, in a vintage year, that Dom Perignon is not going to taste exactly the same because they haven't been able to keep that stability with blending. So that is the majority of champagne you've ever had. That's the majority of sparkling wine you've ever had. Well, I've already covered what vintage is, super special. Cuvée de Prestige means that it's even greater. So typically it's been a vintage year and it's from a really famous house like Louis Rodet or Laurent Perrier, and they're saying this is not just a great year, but we've selected out certain portions of the juice which are even more special for you rich people who need something special. 
And that's where you get things like, um, I believe, Cristal. Cristal is a cuvee de prestige. You just think of it in the word, prestige. When I hear prestige, I hear shit you can't afford, sucker. This is prestigious. You ain't getting this. This is for special people. Do I believe that why? Meh. I've never really had Cristal. So maybe it is so awesome I die in an orgasmic fit. <laughs> but I doubt it. I'm sure it's tasty, but I ain't going nowhere. Not yet, and not from champagne, whether it be Cristal or Dom Perignon, uh, or uh, 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 Grand Cicle from Laurent Perrier. Okay. Now, oh, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, a certain person in the chat room said, have you ever heard of the Justin Winery? They named it after him. If you could guess who <laughs> just joined the chat. The Justin Winery? Do they make champagne? No, but I they, didn't think so. What the hell are you talking about? You talking about Sam? Or no, you're talking about Justin. Justin Graves. Just Justin Graves. Yeah. Justin Graves. <laughs> Why do you torment me? Why? <laughs> You're the albatross. You're the albatross. I will, I will go to my grave, and I want, in my funeral, I want Justin Graves on the coffin being carried in. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, brother. <laughs> for those of you who don't know Justin Graves, he is the, he is the Louis Roder, he is the Cristal of Virginia Tech. Justin is the Cuvée de Prestige of Virginia Tech. If you don't know him, sucks to be you. You should <laughs> chat with him online right now. Someone else want to know your favorite sparkling wine? Was. My favorite sparkling wine, usually the one right in front of me. I'm trying to think if there's. Um, I love everything so much. It usually is. I live in the moment so much. Like right the second I'm drinking this uh, petulant natural wine that we're just in love with, and it doesn't even cost that much. From Avino, or is it? Uh, who is the winery here? Avino. Is it Avino or is it Estadilla? I don't know. I thought it was Avino. I don't know. But this website shit it. is good. It's not even true champagne. Uh, it's not even true sparkling wine. It's not method champenois. But now we should get back to that. Are there other methods besides method champenois? There are. This is in hours three, four, and five. <laughs> uh, I'm putting up this diagram of how sparkling wine production is made, the traditional method. Now that I've described it in very great detail, ad nauseum detail. But I want the takeaway is this: the most important facet of this traditional method, method Chepinois, is that the transformation from a still wine with no bubbles to a wine with bubbles occurs entirely in this exact fancy ass bottle I'm holding in my hand, several thousand miles away from where it was made. It all happened here. And it happened because of the description I've now given you in its production method in contact with yeast and dead yeast. And that is a particularly important component because it adds a flavor profile that we are not going to see when I get to some of these other processes. So any sparkling wine, especially method champenois, will have certain elements of toastiness yeastiness, breadiness, cheesiness, a, a, a nuttiness, almondness that underlies the other flavors going on. And the longer these things have been aged and riddled and all of this other process, the more complex flavors are brought into the fray. And because the champagne is a northern climate wine, high acids, you do these things to soften the acidic nature of the wine itself. So if you ever get the pleasure, and I have, of drinking champagne, of drinking this wine before it goes into the bottling process and the secondary fermentation, it tastes nothing like this. It's, it's, very, it's thinner, it's acidic as hell, and the process itself is what brings the creaminess and the roundness and the complexity to it with the addition and time of yeast and time overall that allows flavors to marinate and the bubbles to form that then change the dynamic of what you're tasting on your palate. Holy crap, I think we are gonna win an Academy Award for this. I'm just yes. making shit up now off the top of my head, but it's all correct. That's how good I am. Okay, 
So, so far during hours uh, one through seven, I've only actually mentioned sparkling wine made in Method Champenois in Champagne, a very specific region of a very specific state we call France. However, there is the rest of the lecture, which, believe it or not, is not going to take as long as what's come before this. Because we have been talking about a method, the Method Champenois, named for this region which invented it and regulated it and it's on the label and everything I've talked about so far, bam, you got all that for this one style of wine called Champagne from the Champagne region. As I've already suggested now for the fourth time, they set the stage that everyone else in the world is copying. So if you know even half of what I've talked about so far, you can actually get almost all the rest of it for the rest of the world. And here's why. Because there are other places, even within France, that use the same method. They do everything exactly the same. They blend different grapes made from a Chardonnay and a Pinot Meunier. Uh, then they uh, put it in bottles, then they dose it, then they riddle it, then they disengorge it. They do everything exactly the same, but they're not from Champagne, so they can't call it Champagne. Method Champenois can be used anywhere. If it's used in Champagne, we call that Champagne. If it's used anywhere else in France, we call that Cremant. Here's a word for you to write down. Cremant, with one of those cool little lines above it. I just realized in the English language, we don't have any words that have a little line above it. We don't have umlauts. We don't have the little hat things that some Spanish word. Why don't we have any other, what I call decorations on words? Why don't we have any vowel decorations in English? God, the English are boring. So cremant, with a little dash over the E, the cremant is any wine from anywhere else in France that does the exact same thing. They do it exact. So you can actually have a cremant from Alsace, a cremant from Burgundy, a cremant from Bordeaux, a cremant from Loire, a cremant from wherever. And in fact, you can have any other wine that's not made Champagne style or Champagne Methanol from France and they'll just put the word Mousseau on it. So if you get a three, four, or five, or even an $8 bottle of sparkling wine from France, you're like, why is this so cheap? Because it ain't champagne, and probably because it's not Method Champenois, it's just sparkling from any other way, which we'll get to in a minute. If you see the word Mousseau, it just means, meh, we put bubbles in this. But here is a great map from Wine Folly. Madeline Puckett, my favorite, favorite humans on planet Earth. God, I hope we can meet her someday. Madeline Puckett, please, please. Divorce your husband. Get over here. I'm here to help. I'll do anything you need. Just come visit us and hang out with us, and I'll woo you with some wines. Yeah, right. This woman drinks a billion wines a day. But this is a map from her site, Wine Folly, and uh, it is the other sparkling wines of France. Champagne we've now covered for 10 hours. But if you look at any other major wine-growing region of France, you can find Method Champenois from that region, and it'll just be labeled as Cremant de the region. So Cremant of this region. Cremant of Burgundy. Cremant of Rhone. Cremant of Bordeaux. And yes, there is a Cremant de Bordeaux. So same method, virtually the same results, but because it's not famous, it doesn't have the cachet of the word champagne, they're wildly affordable. Wildly affordable. So I find, not that I'm a cheap person because I love burning through money, but I find that I gravitate towards Cremants of Loire. Cremant de Loire, I, I, we get so many great sparkling lines from there and they're so easy and it's so accessible for like 20 bucks. I haven't really dabbled too much with any Cremants of Bordeaux, but down in languedoc roussan one of the original, supposedly one of the most original sparkling wines on planet Earth that's had continuous production for hundreds of years before Champagne region was even invented, is called Cremant de Limoux. We've carried it here. It's called Saint Hilaire is the name of the label. Saint Hilaire is a Cremant de Limoux. It's a little region down in Languedoc, and they've been making sparkling wines in Method Champenois style for, I don't know, 500 years? Go look at the interwebs. They have all the answers. 
So you can get great wines in this exact style from all over France, but here's the downside. You just won't be able to pay hundreds of dollars for them. They just cost tens of dollars instead of hundreds of dollars. I know, sucks, right? Actually, there's a Cremant de Jura we had recently in Lake. Oh my God, this stuff is crack. Uh, and now let's get out of France. Let's get the hell out of France for the rest of this lecture. Because there's lots of other places on planet Earth that also use method Chevenois, AKA traditional method to make their sparkling wines. You've probably heard of some of them. I've now mentioned Cremant from anywhere in France. Espamante out of Portugal, Cava in Spain, that is an unsung hero of the sparkling world. Cap Classique from South Africa, a words that I can't even pronounce from Germany because I've never had them. Classique, let's call it Classique Flaschengrank. <laughs> Classique Flaschengrank. Don't you want to drink that? Flaschengrank. I'm scared. Have a glass of Flaschengrank. <laughs> Uh, and ones that I have at are Fran Francia Corta and uh, Trento from the Lombardy region of Italy. They also, again, these words I'm throwing out there mean it's champagne method. So all the fanciness, all the allure, all the labor, all the time, they've got that too. And that's why those wines will cost a little bit more, even though they're from South Africa or Portugal, Spain, or Italy. Uh, by the way, we don't even have a word for it in America. So I'm positive you can get Method Champenois wines from California and they'll probably just put Method Champenois on the label. We just say, yes, this, this wine from Arizona is made in the traditional French Champagne method. So when you see that traditional method or Method Champenois, that's saying wherever it's from, yeah, we did it the old school way. Uh, a couple I did want to point out is, check out Cap Classique from South Africa. If you get a chance to run across South African wines, they'll be wildly affordable, and especially sparkling just because they don't have any name recognition. So I'm always telling people, go get the deals. If it says Cap Classique, that means they did it like champagne. All of it. it, it and it's gonna sell for a fraction of the price because it's from South Africa. That doesn't mean the quality is any worse. In fact, the quality could be better. They just can't command $100 prices for it. And I already mentioned Cava. Uh, and Cava from Spain, you can get Cava's anywhere from 12 bucks a bottle to 100 bucks a bottle, but you'll be hard pressed to find one more expensive than that with the same traditional method. Uh, and I point out, this is also from Wine Folly, this little graphic, because whether it's Spain Austria, South Africa, or the, or the New World, Australia or America, we've all kind of adopted all the sweetness level terminology too. So a brut is a brut is a brut is a brut. Uh, a a demi-sec from Italy is a demi-sec from France is a demi-sec from California. We all just kind of said, yeah, champagne got it all down already. Let's just use that system. And if you, again, if you understand that system, you can get the wine that you want no matter where it's from. Granted, you know, there could be some false advertising here and there, but one would expect that any company producing um, a champagne, or I should say a sparkling wine from South Africa, or, you know, Bolivia, they're going to want to not fool the consumer, they're gonna want you to know. And they say, oh no, no this is brought, because we know that you know what brut means, so this is a brut wine. And if they don't follow those standards and you drink it, you're like, oh God, this is sweet. These people are totally full of shit. You're never gonna buy that again. So the winemakers have no interest in fooling you. They're trying to use the French system to tell you what their product is. Again, I'm sure people screw that up, but. Okay, let's get to the rest of these now in short order. There are other bubble alternatives because the one I've described to you thus far Expensive, laborious, takes time. Who the hell's got time for all that? How else do I get bubbles without all that and all that price? Now we get to the Charmat process, uh, AKA the tank process, AKA method Italiano. 
Uh, and this is where we don't do the secondary fermentation in the bottle. We actually have that wine, that still wine already, and we put it all in a big ass stainless steel tank, maybe the size of this building. And then, to scale, we then dose it in a tank. So we put back in a little bit of sugar, a little bit of yeast, you put it all back into one gigantic tank, then cap that tank, it's a tank, it probably already is capped, but once you pump it in there, it's a metal tank, so it can withstand the pressure of that CO2 building up during the secondary fermentation without the CO2 escaping or without the tank blowing up. So it, the bubbles stay in solution within one gigantic thing, and then you put it into bottles later. That makes sense? The tank method. This is most of your, uh, virtually all Prosecco. I think Prosecco was founded on the tank method. Uh, all the Asti's you've ever had, Asti Spumante, Moscato di Asti, uh, and Lambrusco. Someone mentioned Lambrusco earlier. These are all wines that do the tank method, and because it's a tank method, they can dose it in certain ways that they know how to do it for semi-sparkling versus full sparkling. That's why the Italians have a lot of frizzante wines. That's the semi-sparkling category I talked about 10 hours ago. They, they know how to dose things in a tank that it's like, yes, this just has a little bit of fizz. It has a little bit more fizz. Or it's fully sparkling. We can determine that much easier in a bulk process. Does that make sense? Uh, and this is just a graphic. And I only wanted to point out the graphic so that you understand the main difference between method traditional, method chaperon, and tank method is the device used, the container that's used to turn that still wine into the sparkling wine. Now again, maybe some of you are also thinking, well, wait a minute, how do you take it from a big ass tank the size of a building into a bottle? Because once you have a hose coming from the tank sticking in the bottle, wouldn't all the CO2 just blow off? No, 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 no. You've all opened up a bottle of sparkling wine before. Does all the CO2 immediately run out? It's dissolved CO2. And at lower temperatures, there's entropy. It doesn't want to change. Is it entropy? That's not the word I'm thinking of. What is the law of thermodynamics that things at rest want to stay at rest? Is that entropy? Can somebody help me out? Something, things at chat. rest want to stay. What is it? No, I'm like, ask the chat. Things at rest want to stay at rest. They're not. You're going to have to add heat or electricity. You're going to have to motivate things to move out of the state they're in. Newton's first law. Sure. I'm just saying entropy. Things want to chill out where they're at. They're not interested unless you input something else into the equation. So all of these things are happening under chilled conditions, right? Newton's first law, yeah. Sure. Let's say Newton's first law. There you go. I think you're sure like... I don't know. I just told you I said entropy because I thought that was a cool word I knew. So we're doing all the... The fermentation may occur at a slightly elevated temperature, but once we have the wine where we want it to in the tank method, we're going to chill that sucker down. And once you have it chilled down, things don't want to move. They're not active. So you can easily siphon off all of the beverage from this tank into the bottle, and it's not going to blow up, and all the CO2 is not going to immediately escape. It's just chilling out. You do it pretty quickly anyway. So you have it chilled down, siphon off into each bottle, bottling line going, fill, go, fill, go, fill, go. Caps go on, caps go on, caps go on. Or corks go in. Again, depending on if it's uh, semi-sparkling or fully sparkling. Semi-sparkling wines are fine with a screw cap or a regular cap. You'll often see semi-sparkling wines with a cork and a bottle cap. That's all it needs. It's not under that much pressure. Some sparkling wine, sem some frizzante or semi-sparkling wines you'll see just with a bottle cap. The pressure's not that high. It's not going to blow that cap off. It's more like beer than champagne in terms of pounds per square inch pushing out. So. Tank method, we do it all in one big batch, push it off in individual bottles. Okay? Now, Chermat style wines you may have heard of include Prosecco, famous from Veneto, the northeastern region of Italy, the Asti from the northwestern region, Piedmont of Italy, both fully sparkling uh, and lightly sparkling. And here's a couple of words that maybe you want to know. Fully sparkling from Italy is Spumante, semi sparkling is Frizzante. And I said a while back, yeah, you can go into an Italian restaurant, and they'll usually pour you a frizzante just as an opener. Just like, hey, welcome to our restaurant. Here's a little glass of frizzante, just to get your taste buds motivated. 
Uh, it's also called sect in Germany, specifically sect in Germany and Austria that uses this method. And if you if you see any wine pretty much anywhere on planet Earth that's under 10 bucks a bottle, that's still a decent quality, it's probably tank method. Again, just think about the production. Think about the production method and the time and labor that goes into it. It's a way cheaper way to get bubbles into wine. Doing it in a batch, trapping them in, just putting them in the bottle. And you can filter out at that time too. So the yeast in a big ass batch, in a gigantic tank, the yeast are working in there, the dead yeast float to the bottom and don't really come in contact with the rest of the liquid. And that's important to note so you know what styles of sparkling you like because maybe you're putting two and two together in your own head right now if you're still awake. And understanding the tank method, Charmat method sparklers, don't have as much yeasty, ready, cheesy characteristics, toasty characteristics, because it's a giant batch and not much of the liquid is coming in contact with the yeast. Compared to doing it in this bottle, where only this much liquid is coming in contact with those yeast, perhaps for months to years, and picking up those flavors, Charmat process can happen in months, and you just filter off the beverage away from the yeast, and you don't think about it anymore, and you don't get those flavors. There's your spumante, asti spumante, maybe you've heard of before. Uh, I'm only mentioning the transfer method, and I don't even know why. This is totally trivia, but. It's roughly the same process, but it's a, it, it's a hybrid between the two processes I've explained. So transfer method is for bizarre shaped bottles. Things like half bottles, splits, which is a half a half bottle, is a split, 187 milliliters of wine. Maybe you've had little baby bottles of sparkling wine served to you at brunch somewhere. Uh, or magnums, anything that's out of the ordinary for champagne or any sparkling wine producers, those have to go into a separate bottling line. They're a bit of a pain in the ass. So you can make your true champagne in champagne style, but you, you don't want, this is your standard. You're not trying to, can somebody go get me a split? Do we have any splits anywhere? Yeah. Do we have any splits? Somebody go get me a split real quick. Well, it's champagne or of any? It doesn't matter. Don't we have one in the fridge right there? I just thought it'd be hilarious to think about what it would take for people. When I was talking about the riddling process earlier, this is all done by hand. There's no machines. It's done by hand. So try to think. That's a split. That's a, uh, I want a split. Split. Small bottle. Are we out of those, or was there one in there? So riddling is all done by hand, okay? And it's, it's an art. They haven't fully mechanized it yet, but try to think about... Those are all split. Try to think about riddling this. <laughs> you would have 10 million of these little bottles that you're for months you're going to do, and it's like, oh my God, no, Riddlers would kill themselves, which would please Batman. I can tell you that for nothing. Uh, but you, you can't do the same process for these odd-sized bottles. So the transfer method is a hybrid. You actually make the wine in a bottle, like this, or a, maybe even a slightly bigger batch, using the traditional method. But then you actually take the cork, when you blow the plug out during, uh, a, um, oh, uh, uh, shit, I forgot the, the, the term, engorgement, whenever you, you throw the, kick the cork out, you actually just pour all the wine into a tank. So it's been bottle conditioned, but you're gonna pour it into a tank, a big ass batch, filter it, in the tank and then put it in to all your odd sized bottles. So basically it's kind of true champagne, it's method champenois, but transferred through a tank. Make any sense? Make a little bit of sense? Hope so. Again, it's for odd sized bottles. It's more of a trivia thing. Hopefully you'll win on Jeopardy someday if Alex Trebek still can keep on kicking it for 10 years or more. And the last major type of, of way to get bubbles into wine that I want to talk about is actually really new. So I've been teaching this class for 20 years and I stopped teaching live five years ago. And even five years ago when I gave this lecture, I did not talk about the style because quite frankly, it was an oddball style. I had 
rarely seen it, never tried it, and thought it was just a throw off. Oh, I'm like, it's a trend, something silly. But it's in vogue right now, and I'm drinking it right now, and so I want to talk about it right now. And this is ancestral method. Ooh, that sounds cool or spooky or old. I don't know, whichever. Uh, I think it's better phrased as all natural method. So ancestral method is pretty much what we've been talking about. Pretty much method uh, uh, champignon. Except that they, I don't even know if there is a standard for saying something like this. But they typically use natural yeast. They're kind of letting nature take over the fermentation. So they're going to make wine. Usually it's a more natural wine where natural yeast are doing stuff. They're going to chill down that wine because chilling is a natural filtration. When you chill stuff, shit falls, sediments fall out and particles and fall to the bottom. And then kind of put it in the bottle while it's still kind of happening. And maybe they dose it, maybe they don't because maybe the fermentation is still occurring. And they put it into the bottle, cap it, or cork it, cap it, and let it go. And they usually don't do a whole lot of other things to it. Thus the natural, and you may have heard of these things as called references, petulant natural. In fact, it's a new vogue thing. If you go to Brooklyn, you can find whole bars, I'm sure, that do petulant natural or pet nat wines. We happen to have a few of them here. And this one actually, its whole label just says, okay, can you look at that? Is that, is that showing up on screen? Closer, closer. Uh, it's actually just the biggest words on the bottle are pet nat. And you see that also it, it just has a bottle cap on it. So these are wines that aren't necessarily under tremendous PSI. And they're not technically the method champenois because they don't do all the steps, but they do many of them, including the riddling at least some of them do. Uh, and so this is a wine that I like to point out because it's growing, because the fermentation is naturally built into the bottle as it's fermenting in the bottle. However, they're not wildly popular because um, Pet Nat being a little more crazy, a little more wild, usually unfiltered. So you'll see sediment. You might see shit floating around in it. Uh, these are can tend to be a little more exotic, a little on the funky side even. Some of them can have bizarrely funky flavors. The pet nut that we're drinking right now, and I guess it's, I don't know if it's a pet nut or they're just calling it petulant. It says the word, petulant, yeah. it says petulant. They're saying, no, this wine was, it's all natural yeast. yeah, all natural yeast and it was, I think built in the bottle. I think the CO2 was built in the bottle, although the product is so consistent, I wonder if it's not Charmat, if it's like naturally fermented Charmat style that they're putting in the bottles because it's got great consistency. I don't know the answers to these things. The one, the, a lot of uh, places in the old world that were uh, started doing a lot of pet nat, pet, petulant uh, sparklers are Loire. Uh, Jura does some really interesting ones, but they're coming out all over the place in Spain and the uh, New World now, including America. Petulant Natural, Pet Nat. By the way, you can make Pet Nat wines completely still. Most of the Pet Nat wines we've had here, they're table wines. But they're telling you, no, we just kind of let things happen. And we let the CO2 blow off. But Pet Nat is also a great way to make sparkling wines if you cap it. While the fermentation, you put it in the bottle while the fermentation is still occurring and cap it. So you're right, it, they say on their label, done by Charmant's method. <laughs> called it, called it. Katie looked up the label and it says on the label, Charmant process. So they're infusing elements of kind of the old and the new, the industrial and the natural. And I like it, I, I, I gotta tell you, we did a, our, one of our happy hours, first happy hour we did, this uh, Avino, and it's just crisp, acidic, 
sparkling, almost borderline semi-sparkling. It's not fully charged sparkle, but it's got a lot of zest, a lot of character, just a little hint of funk, good hints of citrus. We get, what do we say, like orange and even hints of peach on this. It's just a good wine. But anyway, I'm waxing poetic. Oh, here's a few examples of some other pet nat wines, petulant natural, and I wanted to show you a picture of ones being poured because you can have pet nat wines that are table wines, like I said. They can be still wines with no bubbles at all, but you can also have sparkling pet nats, and they can be of any color and any flavor. Pretty much, it's a style of making wine. It's not saying anything about the grapes. It's not saying anything about the region. It's not saying anything. It's just saying we're using natural yeast we're letting the wine make itself, and they're likely to be a little funky and likely uh, to be not filtered. This one's definitely filtered, but if you see ones that are cloudy, that's part of the process. They're letting the yeast and letting the stuff hang out there. Much like German Hefeweizen, if you've ever had German beers or some other European beers that have a cloud or a film at the bottom of the bottle, that's the yeast. That's the dead yeast that are hanging out there and they, they bring components of flavor and aroma to the beer or the wine. But if you filter them out, then they don't. So that's the uh, all a natural wine uh, way of keeping bubbles into solution. And now I can finally finish with the shittiest, crappiest way to make wine with bubbles to physically force CO2 into a liquid, and that is through forced carbonation. It's right there in the term. It's forced. It's an illegal entry, in my opinion, that you basically make wine, you make table wine, and then you put it in a tank and hook up a tank of gas and literally force the gas into the liquid. You smash it into the liquid. You're injecting CO2 into this beverage and keeping it under pressure that as you're injecting it into the tank, it can't go back into a gaseous form and escape. Now, are there good wines that use this method? Maybe, but I haven't had them yet. As you might imagine, this is exactly how you make soda pop. Although soda pop even does it better than this, soda pop. You have the tank lines, right? And you have the syrupy, sugary crap in one line and then soda water in another line and then the CO2 pushed in so it mixes it as you pour it out. It's still forced carbonation. But that's soda pop, who gives a shit about that? Doing it to wine, I, I, obviously you can detect from my body language, not really a fan of. And here's why. Because when you force stuff, it wants to escape like any of us. If you force us to do something, we don't want to do it, we want the hell out of there. And when you force carbonate wines, when you open up that cap, that those bubbles can't wait to get the hell out of that shitty product. I pick on Andre, a, a wine that probably many of you had when you were 15 years old, or in college at a sorority fraternity party. And you know, I apologize on behalf of your parents that you did that. I don't know what else to say. And I, I put up this graphic intentionally from the Andre site because look how they labeled it. Andre Brut Champagne. That is such an offense. It's such an offense to every French person that's alive. Virtually most people who live in the EU would take offense to that. And me as a wine person takes offense to that. It's like, really? Wow, your $2.99 beverage that was forced carbonated is champagne. Wow, how did you pull that off? Did you make it in champagne and export it? Hey, that's a question we had in hour one. You can't do that. That's not champagne. They're totally stealing the word, using it improperly, and the only reason they're not being persecuted is because the United States doesn't like France. So we don't care. We're like, nah, the US government's like, oh, we know champagne is a registered trademark everywhere else, but we don't care. We're not gonna make anybody follow that because we'd like to make fun of the French. That's just the government. Uh, nowhere else on planet Earth could you get away with calling your wine champagne, for starters, and two, creating a crappy wine that you call champagne. It's forced carbonated. It's the reason why, and, and again, one of the reasons why I make fun of, of Andre and all forced carbonated beverages, uh, all forced carbonated sparkling wines, is because they're, they're, they're unstable. You're taking a bottle and jamming shit into it. 
right? It's why when you open up a bottle of Andre, it blows up in your face usually about half the time. And they use those cheap ass plastic corks, which are greased with ox blood, I think. They're just straight to shoot out of the damn thing. And because it's forced, it's overpressurized, it's not natural. There's nothing, I have no redeeming things to say about forced carbonization and why. None. I'm sure somebody's probably tweaking it and doing it right, probably somewhere in Brooklyn. Uh, some hipster has probably made a really great one. I just haven't had it yet. And I, the best thing I can say about forced carbonation, and particularly with the Andre label, is something I saw just recently, which is this. And that is that they finally figured out, why the hell are we even putting it in a bottle? <laughs> Put it in a can. It's soda pop. You're forced carbonating it like soda pop. Put it in a freaking can. It's soda pop. Call it brut. Call it champagne. You know what? Call it whatever the hell you want. The bottles were just twisted off anyway. The bottles were twisted. Well, no, but they used to have plastic corks. Yeah. Oh, I've seen more than I've seen more than two people get an Andre cork to the face. And every time I see Andre that has those plastic corks, I'm like, no, 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 no. point it away. No, no. Put it up in the air, just shake it a little, the cork will come off on its own. It's, it's a really unstable situation. So you guys have never seen Andre with corks? No, I haven't. I think back in the day, yeah. Back in the day. See, I've shown my age, and now Andre, when I teach this class 30 years from now, when I'm dead, um, people will be like, Andre in a bottle? I've never seen Andre in a bottle. It's only in a can. What are you talking about, Professor? And they come in mixed drinks, like they're already, like Aperol really? spritz or comes in a keg. I think it just comes in a keg for a nickel. You buy a whole keg of Andre for a nickel. And actually, if you can zoom in on this, if you want the uh, presentation, it actually says at the bottom, carbonated wine. They, I don't even see, no, they've taken off the word, they've taken off the word champagne off this can. That's good. No, no champagne. It says brut, so they're at least following the convention of labeling by sweetness. And it says, fresh tasting with notes of pear and lemon, carbonated wine. There you go, Andre. There you go. Now I'm a fan. Now I love you, Andre. At least you're not bastardizing the product. Okay. And now we can finish up, which all of you, all two of you still listening, are more than ready for us to finish this 30, up. 30 minutes. How many? 30 right now. 30 people are really hanging? What's wrong with you people? <laughs> Do you all have COVID and you actually literally can't get up from your bed to change the channel? Thank you for hanging out here. Uh, to finish up, um, I've now been talking about bubbles for 25 hours. Uh, and I haven't really talked about specifics of bubbles themselves. And I'm not really, I'm on the fence about this theory, but I get it, which is that quality of a sparkling wine is often tied directly to bubble size, bubble formation, and the beautiful little lines of bubbles that are created in your champagne flute when you pour. And I'm torn because I, I, I get it. I do believe that more naturally produced wine, method champenois, even Charmat to a certain extent, uh, but certainly uh, uh, the ancestral method are producing wines that are slowly and more naturally produced. And therefore, the CO2 is better incorporated in the wine. And the longer you let that hang out, the further incorporated it is. So when you open up the cork, and you pop the cork, unscrew the cap, you get a much smaller refined bubble and the wine will sit there and bubble or sparkle for a longer period of time. It's one of the reasons why we design champagne flutes to be champagne flutes. You can pour champagne into any size glass. This glass design was made specifically to highlight long streams of bubbles coming from this beautiful beverage. And when it's well crafted, you can sit there, well, after you pour it, you can just sit there and watch it like a TV show. A really well crafted champagne or sparkling wine from anywhere, which just has beautiful streams of bubbles that will go on for a very long time. And I think it's that slow incorporation 
and the slow incorporation of flavor that's also coming along with that lengthened process that builds much more complex sparkling wines that have the smaller bottles, bubbles, and you start to see we're layering up more and more awesome features for the wine that make us enjoy them more. In contrast, to go back to make fun of Andre, when you pop a bottle of Andre, it's usually gonna blow up in your face, or if you shake it a little, it will certainly spew all over the place. The bubbles aren't incorporated. It's much larger bubbles, and they're ready to fly the hell out of that bottle. That's the alternative universes of how you can uh, make these sparkling wines. Stable formation, over time of production means stable formation or stable enjoyment of the wine once it's open. That's just my personal opinion. I'm sure there's some scientific facts supporting some of these things, but I don't know. Don't take it to the bank, but that's my experience with sparkling wines. As I pointed out earlier, if you like traditional method, if you like a method champignon, if you like Dom Perignon, if you like true champagne, Part of what you like is the yeasty, bready, nutty components that come only from that production style that has contact with yeast. Charmant method is much more fruit forward, acidic, lively. I like, I like both styles, but you need to know what style you like or at least understand what style is being labeled or presented on the bottle when you go to buy the wine. I haven't even gone into, there's lots of different styles of sparkling wine in terms of you can get ones that are much more yeasty, you can get much, ones that are much more fruity, you can get ones that are more petulant, natural, funky. We've talked about some of these elements, but not all of them. So there's great stylistic and flavor variation within sparkling wine, but I was talking most about these main things in terms of, style, of method style of production. Champenois, traditional style, gives you the yeasty stuff if you like that. Charmant, forced carbonation, other styles won't give you that component. If you don't like yeasty, some people don't. Some people are like, ew, this tastes like cheese. And it's like, yeah, I love it. I hate it. Well, then don't drink that one. Then don't drink that the Champenois because you don't like that style. And I also want to add that um, there are lots of, we've mostly been talking about dry wines because that's mostly what, most of us like, but there are tons of sweet wines too. We've had a Moscato de Asti and Dole and semi, uh, 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 Demi-Sec Champagnes, Demi-Sec uh, Cabas. There are lots of sweet wines out there too. For those of you that like a sweet tooth or you say, well, I really don't like white wines. So I really don't like sparkling wines. No, no, no. There's great variation in sweetness levels too. Go try any one of the many Moscato de Asti's or Muscats that we have in your Divinity Cellar right now. I'm sorry, Divinity Cellar, at Blacksburg Wine Lab. So great variation in style, uh, a great variation in flavor, great variation in sweetness. There's a sparkling wine out there for everybody. The future of sparkling wine deserves its own lecture because the future of wine in general is up for question because of the increasing global temperatures. I didn't say global warming because that don't exist for some people, but it's getting warmer, right? Most of you have detected this. And so that affects all wine regions because certain grapes are grown in certain places because they behave certain ways and give us flavors we like. And this is really accentuated with champagne and sparkling wines because sparkling wines by and large are uh, cooler climate situations that have a high level of acid and certain flavor profiles that age well and take to the bubble well. And so as global temperatures go up, the traditional places that are growing sparkling wine are going to be exceptionally challenged. And I point out a couple places in particular that you may end up seeing sparkling wine from, and I've already had sparkling wine from personally. And that is the United Kingdom. The southern part of England will be the new Champagne. The southern part of England's climate is now closer to the way that the Champagne region was 50 years ago than Champagne is right now. You heard it here first. Uh, places like Canada, again, it's a cooler area. Probably going to start seeing some great sparkling wines. Method Champenois out of Canada. And I even threw Russia in here. Russia has forever made sparkling wines, but nobody gets anything from Russia. Ever, really, besides the Cold War. So none of us think to get Russian wines, 
But given their climate and the fact that they've made wine for a very long time, even during Soviet Union time, uh, they have the production, they have the knowledge, and given climate change, they may end up being an interesting source of sparkling wines as well. Yes? Um, someone asked me if you like consider to do a lecture like this one on uh, sweet dessert wines in the future. Yeah, like I said earlier, uh, the question was, but I consider doing a lecture, an ad nauseum lecture like that. I mean, that's what I call this series, the ad nauseum lecture series. Uh, yeah, I can speak ad nauseum about dessert wines as well. And as I s open the, this whole talk, the student request, all six students that responded, three of them said sparkling wine, one of them said old world versus new world uh, wine styles as the topic they wanted to hear about. And one said port and one said cherry. And I'm like, sure. Uh, sweet is pretty broad. And given that this has taken 75 hours to do this one talk, maybe we parse it out and I do a lecture just on port, maybe a lecture just on cherry, maybe a lecture on Madeira, because those are more manageable topics. I mean, you see how long I've gone just talking yeah. about sparkling. In my defense, in my defense, friends, Sparkling is a style. It's a production style. It's the one of the three major styles of wine produced on planet Earth. So there was a lot to cover. And people make sparkling wines all over planet Earth. And they have some stylistic variations, but now hopefully you understand some of those stylistic variations. So this actually was a fairly hefty lecture. It was just one topic, sparkling, but now you've learned a lot because there was a lot to talk about. Talk about port, it's actually pretty sink. That's a region, that's a style, I got that. Sherry, a little more complicated, several different variations of style, but one region, one general profile. Smaller lectures could ensue if you all like this and would like me to do more of this. Just let me know and we'll do what we can. I did want to uh, finish hours ago, but I didn't, so. Uh, I did want to finish only because I have the slides on here, only to point out that there are sparkling red wines, and they're starting to gain in popularity too, and I kind of like a lot of them. So I'm going to include this PowerPoint slash, um, what is this, uh, Keynote. Keynote, for anybody that wants to download it, and you can look at these things in more detail. But I'll just pan through several slides right now to let you know there's a red sparkling wine called Lambrusco. That's absolutely delightful from the uh, Emilia Reggiano region of Italy. And it actually spans multiple sweetness levels too. So you can get dry Lambruscos, which we drink all the time. Dry or semi-dry slash semi-sweet Lambruscos. Fabulous with charcuterie boards, which is why we've always had a Lambrusco by the glass here at Wine Lab. Uh, just a fantastic red semi-sparkling, so Frizzanti style from Italy that's red. Uh, Brichetto di Acchi is a super famous wine within Italy and I guess Europe too. Semi-sparkling, full on red, that many enophiles and foodies say is the match literally made in heaven for chocolate pairings. People that have ever done a Brichetto di Aki in any chocolate basically died on the spot and were never heard from again. People say it is the greatest pairing ever. I, I have to admit, i am not done it. I'm not much of a sweet tooth, but it is a fully sweet, red, semi-sparkling wine that apparently makes chocolate turn into an orgasm. But you didn't hear that from me. And then finally, I wanted to go down under to a wines that I actually have had and not really enjoyed that much, which is sparkling Shiraz, or Shiraz. So you can get uh, Shiraz sparkling, because the Australians are the Australians, and they do everything differently. Uh, and so they experiment with lots of different things, and they were the first ones that I ever had a New World sparkling red from. Uh, they're still kind of rare, but since I tried them 20 years ago, they were horrible. I've heard that the quality level has come up significantly. So any of you that are big red drinkers and you're like, I don't like champagne, I don't like sparkling wine because I like reds, try some of these others. And the sparkling Shirazes can be semi-dry to sweet as well. I think they favor the dry side. But I think that's all I got for now, unless there's questions, there you go.
Well, I was just saying they had some suggestions of <laughs> can you do a lecture on how to open a, a corked wine with a, without a bottle opener? <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's plenty of stunts yeah. like that on YouTube already, how to open a bottle without and there's the, a corkscrew. People are saying, yes, please more live lectures. Please more live lectures. Can I just ask, is there any night of the week that's better than others? We're all in quarantine, yeah. so. I was going to say, in quarantine, what difference does nights of the week mean? <laughs> Who gives two shits? It's Saturday the 15th. It's Monday the 3rd. It's Thursday the 2nd. Who cares? You're not going anywhere. That's what I'm here for. I'm your humble entertainment. I uh, do have to admit I was hesitant to do this. Not because I don't enjoy it. Uh, I actually really do. I'm a natural. I love lecturing. I love informing people. I love doing it live. I don't mind doing it online. But I truly did hesitate to do this because I, I don't like doing crap everybody else is doing. I, I have to admit, if I see a hundred other people doing it, I'm going the other way. And so, thanks to the awesome Katie, I started doing recorded lectures and live streaming ten years ago. Before it was Vogue. And I enjoyed it, it was fine. Then I got super lazy. And we're like, nah, we have all this content. I don't really have to work hardly anymore. And we started writing books and all this stuff. And we started a bar. Psh, go figure. And so I got away from doing things like this. And then since this crisis has hit, and there's literally 35 million podcast Zoom TV shows now, it actually makes me want to barf in my own mouth and swallow it that I would even do this. Because I do not ever want anyone to think, oh, Boyer's doing a show like everybody else. Because I'm like, oh, oh, it does feel like that a little bit. You're a node. People connect through you. Uh, yes, I did have enough people ask me to do this. I'm small time, small potatoes in small town, southwestern Virginia. Don't have an ego about it. But when enough people ask me, I'm like, all right, okay, sure. Ten people want me to do a talk? I'll do a talk. It's fine. I don't want anyone to think that I'm trying to build a show. Click, will you like me? Will you please like me? Will you click like? Oh, don't ever click like. I want to put up a button on my talks that says hate. I, I want to have a button that says like, hate, and hate, but I learned something. I, that's all. Hate, but I would love hate, but I learned something. Click on that. That guy was annoying as shit, but damn it, I learned something. Yeah, click that. That means something to me. I don't need any ego rub. So I do want you to know, not ego driven, not trying to build followers, but, but could you click here and like us and follow us and uh, follow us on, on social media and uh, Instagram and YouTube and, and click like and... We'll... Yes, if you like this, just let me know and we'll do more of them. Because I am going to, I think I've decided since I had enough requests for this that we're going to redo the entire wine class in its entirety. And I want to do it terroir focused. So build it up from the base and be like, here is the way to think about wine, that it's from a place. And then go through the whole, here's how you make wine, here's how you grow grapes, here's how you make wines. And here are the wine regions that are expressing their terroir. And then do lectures on France and Spain and Italy and sub lectures on Loire and Burgundy. That's what I'd like to do with the remaining two to three years I've got left of life. That seems like a lot of time. Let's say one and a half years. And so, and I want to do it here through the Blacksburg Wine Lab channel because that way we can pull up wines and maybe every time we release a lecture, we have a wine selection series. It's like, here's all the wines Boyer talks about in this lecture if you want to drink them while you watch the lecture. That was always my dream, by the way. One of the reasons why Katie and I started the bar is I said, would it be great if I could lecture about wine and people were actually drinking the product I was talking about while we're talking about it? That's my problem with online crap. It's like, oh, we can't, uh, I guess, unless you came here and bought the wine already, you can't experience this together simultaneously learning while you're drinking. I mean, like, oh, I see the bubble retention you're talking about. 
Katie's looked at her watch like three times and she's laughing, which oh, means. She's getting texts, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I guess we can wrap this up now. Is there any, anything else I need to say? Anything else I need to do to avoid imprisonment? Uh, the law coming after me? Uh, political correctness police coming after me? I don't know who else is coming. Donald Trump coming after me? I don't know. He doesn't drink, so he's not watching this. <laughs> he should drink, but he doesn't. Okay, well, thank you all so much for the great privilege of entertaining you. Oh, that was great. That was a great laugh at the perfect moment. The great privilege of entertaining, hopefully informing you about sparkling wines uh, while you're hanging out at your home. Uh, for all future requests for lectures, hit me up where, Katie? Blacksburg Wine Lab? Uh, do I, is my email there Boyer at Blacksburg Wine Lab? Yeah. Boyer at Blacksburg Wine Lab. Yeah, for wants to know there's a quiz. Oh, and a quiz. Well, we got to make some damn questions. So. so it'll be up in the next, probably tomorrow. Yeah, maybe Shall by tomorrow. Shall we tell people to send you questions? Uh, oh, yes. Your if your student's or... in the class uh, and you can write me up some questions about things you learned, send those questions to me so I can build a quiz for you all. That'd be great. Uh, and any future request of lectures, Boyer at Blacksburg Wine Lab dot, is it dot com? Yes. <laughs> I knew she'd answer me. And uh, have a great night. I'm sure that everybody's staying healthy and safe. And we'll see you at an undetermined time in the future for our next surprise topic about wine. Party on and drink well. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready.